Okay. Director, you saw my note about that one second. You saw my note about Director Keegan and Director Krim. Oh yeah, they're not. Okay. All right. So you yeah. Know. All right. But the other folks on. Okay, so I can do something. All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, special joint meeting with the Sunny, Sunny the Sunnyvale City Council uh, and Valley Water uh, is called to order. Madam Clerk, uh, please call the roll. Director Shua? Here. Director Keegan? Is absent. Director Kremen? Is absent. And we'll be joining in a little while. Director Lazat? Here. Director Santos? Yes. He's present. Director Varela? Here. Chair Estramera. Aye. We have a quorum present. Uh, thank you. So I'd like to turn uh, turn it over to Mayor Larry Klein so that the Sunnyvale City Clerk uh, may call the roll. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, uh, Mayor Klein. It's been a few years since we had this meeting, uh, but I just want to say thank you for, for resuming these discussions, and especially during difficult times. Uh, let me go ahead and... Um, Pass it to the city clerk to to do call a call to order for and roll call for our council members. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor Present. Vice Mayor Hendricks. Attending. Councilmember Larson. Present. Councilmember Melton. Present. Councilmember Pong. Present. Councilmember Cisneros. Present. Councilmember Dean. Here. Seven present participating in health. Thank you. I'll pass it back to the chair. Thank you. Uh, would everyone uh, please stand and join us for the pledge? Uh, Director Santos can lead us. Please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, invisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Director Santos. <clears throat> uh, good evening. My name is Tony Estramera, Chair of the Valley Water Board of Directors. Uh, on behalf of our board, I'd like to welcome the Sunnyvale City Council uh, and also your staff. Um, thank you especially uh, for joining us uh, this evening. We have a long history of meeting jointly to discuss topics of mutual interest between our organizations and how we can partner on important issues to the benefit of our communities. And even though the pandemic posed a lot, a lot of challenges um, over this last year and a half, I'm uh, pleased that we're both committed to continuing this tradition so that we can best serve our mutual constituents. Despite the challenges of operating during a pandemic, Valley Water has continued moving forward on our projects and was able to mobilize quickly to take action on the drought. Our priorities remain focused uh, on providing safe, clean, and reliable water, advancing and building flood protection projects, and carrying out our environmental stewardship activities. However, our most urgent priority is helping our communities maintain a reliable supply of water throughout this drought emergency. We'd like to thank the Sunnyvale City Council for the water conservation actions that you have put into place. Valley Water will continue to assist you as we work to secure emergency water supplies. We also continue to bolster our drought resilience through innovative technology such as recycled water so that Valley Water, so that Silicon Valley is prepared for more frequent and more severe droughts that are now of course caused by climate change. Valley Water cannot achieve the region's water sustainability on our own. And of course, that's why uh, we're committed to working very closely with you. Given that, I wanna personally thank the council and your staff for making time to meet and for your efforts coordinating the presentations that we will see here today. Let me also acknowledge the work of our Valley Water staff. Uh, that is much, much appreciated. I'll now turn to Mayor Klein for any introductory remarks that he wishes to make, and then we'll have uh, we'll go to introductions. Mayor Klein. Sure. Thank you very much, Chair. 
And, you know, it's been quite a few years since we had our last meeting, and the world has definitely changed since then. Uh, we're doing these meetings remote. It looks like you are at least doing some uh, in-person meetings now. Uh, but, you know, when we last met, we were still meeting in person, and, you know, remote meetings are at least a way of life for the short term and probably for the long term. Uh, but it's good to resume these discussions, you know, especially in light of these times of drought that we're currently living in. You know, water is a precious resource in the Valley uh, and California overall. And I think, you know, it's, it's important that these meetings are, are really um, critical to look at the partnership between our two organizations, making sure that each of us is, you know, breaking through any barriers that we have, but from, from a trying to path, um, set a path forward, it's, it's critical that we make sure that we're both on the same page and figuring out what we can do to be mutually beneficial for the for the two organizations. So, so with that, you know, I'll I'll let uh, I'll go ahead and introduce each of the council, my council colleagues. Um, I'll have I'll have them basically say how long we've been on council, and um, I think that's a quick, at least a quick introduction from our side. So I'm you know Sunnyvale Mayor Larry Klein. I've been on council now just over five years, just a few weeks over five years. And it was uh, direct, became the first directly elected mayor last November. Uh, next up is Vice Mayor Hendricks. Yeah, hello, this is Glenn Hendricks. I'm the vice mayor. I've been on the council for about seven and a half years. And I also sit on VTA as the, and I'm currently the chair of VTA. Thank you, Council Member Larson. Hello, Gustav Larson. I too have been on council seven and a half years. And I also sit on the Bosco board of directors where I'm the chair. Thank you. Council Member Melton. Thank you, Mayor. Russ Melton, Sunnyvale City Council Member for five and a half years, was reelected to represent Sunnyvale District 4, Southeast Sunnyvale, uh, last year. Uh, and I serve um, LAFCO and have had the honor of serving on LAFCO with a number of the Valley Water Board of Directors members over the years. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Fong. Yes. Hi, everyone, and thank you for having this meeting. Uh, reaching towards the end of my first term uh, at the end of next year. So really looking forward to this meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Cisneros. Hello, everyone. Um, and thank you for having this meeting. I'm very excited to learn more about this partnership and be part of this going forward. Um, I was elected in November of 2020 to represent District 2, which is the downtown area of Sunnyvale. And finally, Council Member Dean. Thank you. Hi. Uh, you'll have to forgive me for having my camera off. I was having some Wi-Fi issues, and uh, if my voice sounds, starts sounding robotic, you'll have to let me know, but I think it's working for now. Uh, but my name is Omar Dean. I've been on the council uh, along with Councilmember Cisneros since November of 2020, so reaching about our 10-month mark. Thank you very much. And with that, uh, I'll pass it back to the chair. Thank you, Mayor. Um, our Vice Chair, um, it's, it's not here yet, uh, and then uh, so I'll call on um, starting with uh, Director Varela. Good evening, Mayor Klein and Council Members from Sunnyvale. I am John Varela. I represent District 1, which is the single largest of the seven districts in the Valley Water, from the eastern foothills of San Jose, over the Santa Teresa foothills, into the beautiful Coyote Valley, south into the city of Morgan Hill, where I served as mayor a few years back. Uh, down to San Martin and the city of Gilroy. It's a real pleasure to be with you tonight. I've been on the Valley Water Board of Directors. I'm the newbie. I've been there six years. So I'm still learning. I have a lot to learn. And so I could teach all of you. Thank you. Um, Director Keegan is, uh, is on vacation. She's on a wonderful cruise. So we'll go next to Director Santos. Good evening, everyone. Mayor Klein, the council. Nice to be working with you. We just saw uh, a couple of you at the recycling committee. It was a very good meeting. Uh, Richard Santos, District 3, rep honored to represent Sunnyvale, Santa Clara, Alviso, Melpitas, and all of Berryessa to McKee Road. It's been an honor, and I've been here 20 years, and I enjoyed every day of it. Thank you. Director Linda Lazar. Good morning, Mayor Klein. It's good morning to me. Good afternoon, Mayor Klein and members of the council. Uh, nice to see some of the council members who I've served on other boards with. Uh, I represent District 4, which is uh, all of the city of Campbell, 
uh, parts of Down Midden Valley, uh, the Cambrian area, and parts of Willow Glen. I'm in my 11th of 12 years. Thank you. Director Nyshua. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, uh, Mayor Klein, Vice Mayor Hendricks, and uh, members of the uh, council, <coughs> City Council. Uh, thank you for coming to uh, tonight's meeting. My name is Nai Xue. I represent District 5, uh, which includes uh, Saratoga, Cupertino, West San Jose, and uh, half of Sunnyvale. That's the Sunnyvale south of um, Central, uh, uh, Central Expressway. Um, and looking forward to a product meeting tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Director. And for me, I've, this is my 26th year of service. It's the fourth time I've served as chair. Um, I represent uh, District 6, which is basically um, south of downtown San Jose, most of the east side, and the Franklin McKinley area. Um, now I'd like to uh, open the public comment item and direct uh, anyone wishing to address uh, the members of the board or members of the city council um, to address us at this point on any issue that's not on our agenda this evening. Do we have any requests for public comment? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I have a Mr. Bruce Hain. Yes, Mr. Mr. Hain. Okay, I'm unmuting. Are you able to hear me? We can hear you, sir. Good evening. Great. Don't know if the camera's working or not. Um, oh, okay. Great. So this comment is, in fact, about water. It's primarily for the Sunnyvale City Council members. Yes. Um, my name is Bruce Hanna. I live in one of the townhome complexes in Sunnyvale. It was built in the 1970s. And we have central water metering for our complex. So, of course, central metering means that nobody here in our complex actually receives an individual water bill. So nobody has a direct financial incentive to conserve water. So if I waste water, I'm basically spending somebody else's money. It increases the bills of my neighbors and it gets rolled into the homeowners association dues. So in July of this year, I investigated whether it would be possible for us to actually install per residence water meters and do individual billing. Uh, when I asked about this, the Sunnyvale Utility Billing Department replied that the city will not manage the billing for us if we were to install per home meters. So even if a townhome wants to do the right thing by rolling out per home water meters, we apparently can't do it because the city will not send the bills. I was very surprised at that. So I have two requests to the city. First, if such a policy does exist that will not do billing for townhomes that add meters, please change that policy so we can do the right thing. Uh, and second, I would suggest an incentive program or just pass a law for existing construction that requires all townhomes and condos to add per unit water meters. So I'm aware that new construction probably already requires this. Legacy construction like ours built in the 70s probably does not require it presently. I actually checked um, my homeowners association dues and it turns out about 25% of what I'm paying to my homeowners association each month is just for water, which is crazy when we have all kinds of grounds and buildings and grounds and reserves and so forth. But I can't do anything to reduce that amount on water spending because I'm basically paying for my neighbor's collective water use. So if Sunnyvale could change the billing policy so we can do uh, per unit metering and change the law, you'll reduce water consumption and also help people to save money. So thanks for your support. And I'm happy to discuss as a follow-up uh, via email. I'm actually, I'm ahana21 at gmail.com. That's H-A-H-N-E-2-1 at gmail.com. Thanks for your support on this. Thank you, Mr. Han. I will mention that uh, I know a number of years ago that uh, Valley Water did have a project where we uh, did exactly that uh, for mobile homes uh, for the, the exact reason that you mentioned, which is it's an incentive to uh, get folks at, at the time, of course, long before climate change and, um, and um, um, uh, continuing droughts. Um, um, it was a way of saving water and uh, people really did because then they understood and they saw their billing and so on and so they, they took a much more uh, personal responsibility and accountability for their water use so it's a great idea um any any other folks i have no other hands raised at this time mr chair okay great thank you madam chair so um now i'd like to uh, turn things over to chief executive uh, officer rick calendar for the next agenda item 
Right. A good evening, Chairs, Member, members, and members of the board. Good evening, Mayor Klein, and members of the Sentinel City Council. I, I know most of you have heard that the U.S. Drought Monitor has Santa Clara County is being in an extreme drought, and obviously, we have no idea how long this is going to last or how much worse that this is going to get. Um, many of you have probably heard it. It's, yes, it's the driest year since 1977, and it's on track to be the third driest year in our 100 years of record keeping. And so looking at this local emergency situation, it was on June 9th that the Valley Water Board of Directors declared a water shortage emergency condition in Santa Clara County uh, due to the extreme drought. And that emergency situation, we also called for a reduced water usage by 15% compared to 2019. When you're looking at this in terms of how this looks throughout the state, Shasta Lake and Oroville Dam, two of the largest state's reservoirs, are at 22, uh, 23 and 22% of capacity right now. Anderson Dam, you might have heard of, is our largest reservoir is empty due to FERC, that's the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, ordering that we empty the dam while we're trying to fix it due to seismic issues. The one thing I can say is that, yes, we are all in this together, and you'll hear both this and in later items, we're trying to do our part as Valley Water to ensure that the water supply is available during the drought for homes and businesses, but we also need everyone else in the county to do their part with helping to achieve the, our conservation goals. And we're happy to partner with Sunnyvale to help the residents and businesses to save water and to be part of that solution. And so with that, I'm going to turn this over to our Water Utility Chief, Aaron Baker, who's going to be co-presenting on this drought emergency item. Uh, Chief Baker. Thank you, CEO Callender. And you're absolutely right, the time to conserve is now. Uh, I'd like to start by saying that we, uh, I greatly appreciate uh, working with the, the City of Sunnyvale staff uh, and partnering with them on, on the many things that we have going on. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce Ms. Nita Bajor, and she will be giving uh, the next part of the presentation. Good evening. I'm Nita Bajor, Senior Water Resources Specialist, and I'll be providing the update regarding the water shortage emergency condition and the call for conservation. Next slide, please. So as CEO Calendar mentioned, we are in a serious drought right now, and the U.S. Drought Monitor is reporting that our county is currently in extreme drought, as you can see in the northeastern portion is an exceptional drought. For timeline of events, in April, our governor declared a drought emergency in our state. And in May, this was expanded to 41 of our 58 counties. On June 9th, Valley Water declared a water shortage emergency condition and requested Santa Clara County to proclaim drought, which was done on June 22nd. On July 8th, the governor expanded the drought proclamation to Santa Clara County. Next slide, please. So imported water is critical to our water supply. Our water supply also depends on local water supplies, recycled water, and conservation. But imported water is the largest component of our supply, accounting for about half. Next slide, please. So this year's lack of spring snow and warm weather left our state's snowpack virtually gone by May. And this was about two months earlier than average. And much of our imported water that we use comes from the state's snowpack, particularly the Northern Sierra, and it has now dwindled to 0% of average. This means the amount of imported water we may receive this year and next is highly uncertain. Next slide, please. Our state's reservoirs reflect the drought's impact on the snowpack. Reservoirs are at low levels compared to historical conditions. Next slide, please. As a result of the low state reservoir levels, our imported water allocations have been cut drastically. The state water project allocation is only at 5% this year. Typically, this can be around 60 to 70%. The Central Valley Project allocation for agriculture is zero. 
and it's 25% for M&I, and this stands for the Municipal and Industrial Allocation. Valley Water was able to secure nearly 29,000 acre feet of public health and safety water. This is from the Bureau of Reclamation. And this increases the quantity of our M&I water to be equivalent to an M&I allocation of about 55%. The San Luis Reservoir has been drowned down to a low level and is expected to remain low through November. It's currently below 250,000 acre feet and this has been impacting water quality. The Valley Water has been managing these issues by making process adjustments at the treatment plant. Next slide, please. So as has been mentioned, we have low imported water allocations and uncertainty of future allocations. And in addition, we cannot store water locally in our largest reservoir, Anderson. And this is due to the order by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to drain it for public and health and safety reasons. Normally, Anderson has the ability to store more than all of Valley Water's other nine surface water reservoirs combined. Next slide, please. So our groundwater levels may drop significantly due to limited recharge, increased pumping, and reduced imported water allocations, as well as the loss of Anderson Dam. Emergency imported supplies and additional water use reduction by the community have begun to help slow the groundwater level declines. However, projected 2022 groundwater storage is similar to what was observed during the drought in 2014, which continues the risk in 2022 of resumed subsidence in North County and wells going dry, particularly in South County. One report of a dry well has been received the well is in an unincorporated area within the southwestern Coyote Valley and is close to the foothills where well yield is generally less reliable. And groundwater is a, is a component of county water use of about 40%, so it's quite a key component. In South County, groundwater is the only source of drinking water. Next slide, please. So Valley Water has taken several steps to address drought. The Board of Directors declared a water shortage emergency condition on June 9th and called for adoption of water use restrictions, as well as a reduction of water use by 15% compared to 2019 levels. The resolution commits Valley Water to aggressively promoting our water conservation programs to all water users. It also calls for restricting irrigation on lawns and ornamental landscapes to a maximum of three days. Next slide, please. Valley Water has doubled the landscape rebate for our landscape rebate program from $1 to $2 per square foot. We've also um, expanded our outreach campaign. It's in multiple languages. It promotes Valley Water's conservation tools as well as programs. The campaign includes ads on TV, radio, online, social media, as well as print, and an online engagement website called Be Heard. Retailer contracts for treated water deliveries were reduced, and in May, the managed recharge program was scaled back, especially in North County, due to the low imported water allocations. However, recharge of the imported water in the Morgan Hill facilities did continue at the pre-drought levels. In August, additional imported water supplies did enable increased recharge in Coyote Creek and in a number of ponds in the Guadalupe and Los Gatos recharge systems. Currently, imported water is not being released in the county streams, except in Coyote Creek. 
The Valley Water Board of Directors is receiving monthly updates regarding the drought emergency and retailers are receiving monthly updates in ad hoc meetings. Next slide, please. Valley Water is offering a number of conservation programs to all water user types. This includes residential, commercial, and agricultural. These programs can save water indoors and outdoors. Valley Water also has a program for which water waste can be reported, and the reports are addressed through educational assistance. Workshops and resources are available, including a new guidebook on sustainable landscaping. And we've seen a tremendous growth in our conservation programs this year. Next slide, please. So the county of Santa Clara and 11 cities in our county have taken action to their councils in response to the extreme drought conditions and to Valley Water's call to reduce water use by 15%. Some retailers like San Jose Municipal Water System have implemented several administrative measures such as watering restrictions and messaging. And investor-owned retailers have also taken actions such as for implementing restrictions and water shortage contingency plans. On July 27th, the Sunnyvale City Council adopted a resolution declaring a stage two water supply shortage and setting a goal of a 15% water use reduction. Thank you for taking this action. Next slide, please. Valley Water thanks the county, cities, retailers, and community for all the efforts to reduce water use. And these efforts truly are working. The graph here shows total water use for all retailers by month for 2019 in blue and 2021 in orange. The graph helps track progress towards achieving the 15% call for water use reduction. Countywide, the percent change of water use compared to 2019 has been steadily decreasing since March 2021. And this shows that retailers, cities, and our communities are responding to the call for conservation. In March 2021, water use in Santa Clara County was 25% higher when compared to March 2019. In July 2021, the county used 6% less water compared to Ju July 2019. Our latest data has just come in for August, and it shows that the county is using 9% less water compared to August 2019. So we're continuing to see progress in Valley Water anticipated that reducing water use countywide by 15% would be a gradual process. We're very encouraged to see the numbers trending in the right direction. Next slide, please. For Sunnyvale, the percent change of water use compared to 2019 has been steadily decreasing since April 2021. And the latest data from August shows that Sunnyvale's water use was 7% lower than August of 2019. And when considering Valley Water's water use only, Sunnyvale's water use in August was 14% lower than August 2019. And these numbers show Sunnyvale's commitment to water use reduction. Next slide, please. The Model Water Efficient New Development Ordinance, which we also call WENDO, was developed to ensure that new development will meet strong water efficiency standards. Valley Water will be working to encourage adoption of WENDO in our service area, and the topic is going to be addressed at a drought <clears throat> summit that's being organized by Valley Water on October 23rd. And during the summit, elected officials and community leaders we'll discuss ways to address the drought together and to help lead our communities through this emergency. Thank you, and at this time, we can take any questions. Thank you. Uh, before we do, uh, we'll go to uh, uh, public comment, and then uh, we'll take uh, questions and uh, discussion from board members and council, council members. We have any uh, public comment? 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have no hands raised at this time from the public. Okay, great. Um, uh, any uh, members of the city council or the board have uh, any comments or questions? Yeah. Uh, Mayor Klein has his hand raised. Yes, uh, Mayor Klein. Sure, I'll start it off, and I'm sure my colleagues have multiple questions. Uh, first, uh, and Anderson Reservoir, what is the timeline for that construction? Because that, that's been an ongoing effort, I know. Yes. There were questions, um, I think the governor vetoed a bill last year relating to expediting that, that process. So where, where is the timeline since that's the biggest water resource that you're really looking at? Good question. Uh, Chair Esther Mira, this is Melanie Richardson, Assistant yes, Melanie, CEO. I would be happy to answer that question. Yes, good evening. So, uh, Mayor Klein, um, the Anderson Dam project is actually broken up into two projects. The first one is the emergency project, which we refer to as the FERC Order Compliance Project. We actually have begun construction on that. Um, we just issued a notice to proceed to begin the tunnel work, and that project consists of in addition to draining the reservoir, building a expedited low level tunnel, a large tunnel that lets us keep the water level low as storms come in. Unlike the old tunnel we had that was very small and didn't allow us to, to drain the reservoir. That is expected to be completed in early 2024. And then the second portion of the project, the full retrofit will begin soon after that and is expected to go through at about 2030. So altogether, it is roughly a 10-year project. Okay. That, and we're, that's we're doing everything we can to keep on that schedule and to expedite it. But as you might imagine, we have about eight regulatory agencies overseeing us that we have to coordinate with, with and that, that makes it you know somewhat complicated. Okay, that's that's useful. And, and if there's any advocacy that... that our city can do or or from a from a kind of a community collaboration definitely pass that on to us and my next question has to do with with uh the wa the wells themselves and underground water and and from that standpoint you know this is something that i've brought up for multiple years now and now we're hearing about wells that are basically running dry in certain areas of the county how many you know how many sources are we not metering you know, from a from from those that are actually taking groundwater on their own because it is a a critical resource from forty for forty percent of the valley and and how are we doing and I think you know one of our next items we'll we'll talk about that but how are we doing as far as that underground water? Uh, through the chair, I'd like to answer that question. Absolutely. Aaron. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, actually, uh, so uh, valley water uh, meters. Over 90% of the water that's extracted from the ground volumetrically, and I'm actually going to ask uh, Vanessa De La Piedra, our groundwater uh, unit manager, to talk about the policies that we have in place on on groundwater metering. Yes, thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor Klein and Council members and Board of Directors. I'm Vanessa De La Piedra. I'm Valley Waters Groundwater Management Manager. Uh, and like Aaron said, we have uh, extensive metering policies. We're metering over 90% of the groundwater that's extracted. And especially in the northern portion of the county, um, that basin is very highly metered. Most of the pumping there is through water retailers. So all of those wells are metered. Um, so a very high fraction of those. In the southern portion of the county where we have more of a mix of domestic wells, we have several thousand domestic wells as well as agricultural users. Many of those are very, very small users with small amount of pumping. So they are not actually metered, but they're still required to report their production to us on a regular basis. Um, and typically that's based on people of average uses, based on things like how many people are in the household, um, if it's agricultural irrigated acreage and, and crop types and, and information like that. But we do have a very good handle on the water that's pumped from the basin. And of course we do very extensive monitoring to be aware of groundwater level changes and conditions. Okay, uh, and, and I'll go back to uh, what I've said previously is encouraging those, those non-metered wells to actually be metered because i think as as the resident that spoke earlier you know it's it's making sure that they are paying for not an estimated amount but an actual amount and, and lastly of course is you know the drought and the goal of 15 percent uh from a statewide and i know that we're doing slightly better you know we're still not at our 15 percent from a county from a city standpoint 
what's the next steps that Valley Water sees in trying to help our residents around the county meet, meet that goal of 15%? Or what new, me what new measures are, are being contemplated, if I may ask? Excellent question. Uh, I think um, for what we've learned, at least from, from uh, we are heading in the right direction and we greatly appreciate that. And Sunnyvale's 14% uh, reduction on our Valley Water sources uh, we, we thank you very much. We also, uh, you know, again, thank you on July when you when you declared your stage two water shortage emergency. Uh, so right now we know from the last drought, it, it took us over nine months to kind of, you know, to see the, the impacts of our initial calls. Um, that being said, as we keep our eyes open into uh, what 2022 may have in front of us, uh, you know, this drought is coming on faster than, uh, you know, than, than the last drought. Um, you know, the reservoirs are lower than they, you know, than they have been uh, in quite a while. And so with that, um, we're working internally to understand uh, what it would, what we would like to do to, to ramp up some of that conservation. Again, looking at uh, uh, possibly concentrating more on the outside water use, which typically, well, for those that have converted their lawns or do certain things, we greatly appreciate all that. We're not asking for public health and safety, but we are trying to concentrate or look at where that where the water use really is, and that's that's the outside watering that we see, you know, going on. And so, uh, understanding and focusing on um, how we can reduce some of that outside uh, landscape irrigation uh, without cutting into what we'll what we'll call uh, people's public health and safety uh, are some of the things that we're beginning to look at. Um, the other thing would be is that we also, uh, you know, like to partner with uh, with our retailers. You know, we've we've made this call for 15%, and we know that um, that you know your constituents uh, <laughs> as well, or as as you like to say, you get the calls before we do. Uh, you know, better than we do, and so we're we're uh, um, you know meeting regularly with your staff and with with all the retailer staff to understand what we think might be the best uh, next step uh, given your your particular needs. Um, we have, uh, you know, we are stepping up our, our conservation programs. We are looking at at, uh, at, uh, at those types of things. I think the, the big thing that's on the horizon, which we we are at the end of this year, we'll be looking at projections for, for the end of 2022, calling for, possibly calling for um, an, an additional, um, uh, additional or a higher amount, which would also, then we would also recommend uh, shorter water use restrictions, such as possibly watering only one day a week, or uh, looking at some of those other things that we can we can do to make sure that we're uh, looking at uh, what it takes to get things moving forward. Um, the other thing that we've also got our eyes on is 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 understanding that if this drought continues on, not only do we look at the end of next year, we're looking at the end of the year after that, and and understanding that uh, we need to make the, the the have the right plans in place so that we can understand you know, what, where, how we ramp these things up and the time it takes to take that. So I know I kind of danced around a couple of the questions there, but we are really looking at additional water use reduction measures. We are looking to actually also uh, learn from you and the retailers as to what would work for your constituents. Uh, you know, we make the call for the recommendation, but we also want to understand, um, you know, how can we help, uh, how can we work together to get the, 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 the residents to conserve? Okay, I appreciate that answer and I do. Uh, I do agree. We're all kind of learning along the way here, and you know, and as we enter another drought. So, thank you for that, and that's all I have for now. Thanks. I'll just, I'll just quickly add that you know we uh, we have increased our investments in in our conservation programs, uh, and also of course we'll have our forthcoming um, pretty ambitious uh, public uh, campaign to remind folks about how important it is to conserve. Um, Great. Madam Clerk? Yeah, we Thanks. have Council Member Larson. Yes, Council Member Larson. Good evening, sir. Yes, thank you, Chair. Appreciate it. Um, this is really a, a comment more than a question, although I welcome your thoughts as well. Um, really appreciated the data on water use um, compared to 2019. Glad to see that that's trending in the right direction. And I know that um, every drop counts at this time. And whether we're able to save 15% or even save more than 15 percent um, every drop we save now is a drop that will be available next year should the drought continue um, and i know that many agencies are using 2019 as the baseline for their call for reduction and of course uh, covid has been a confounding factor with uh, work from home just going 2019 to 2020 a lot of areas saw their residential water use go up and their non-residential go down because people were working from home. Sure. Um, and so if we're comparing 2020 use to, to pre-COVID, um, 
depending upon the mix of non-residential versus residential in a particular community, some of that apparent savings might simply be, they have a lot of um, offices, for example, that are now empty. Um, that's not actually conserving water regionally. Um, it's just shifting it around between communities. So it could be helpful to see um, the, the usage numbers broken out residential versus non-residential and also 2019 versus 2020 versus 2021 because really I think now that some things are start people some people are starting to go back schools are reopening but not everything is the baseline usage is probably somewhere between 2019 and 2020 um, and that might help us understand um, where the message the conservation message is really getting through and where we might need to focus more messaging are the residents you know really getting it or the businesses do they need to do more or vice versa so just a comment that it may be helpful to uh, get some finer granularity on the data to, to understand um, where we're going. And I appreciated the, the comments earlier about also um, looking into outside water use to, it sounds like you're already taking steps to understand where the conservation uh, opportunities are. Um, but I, I think as city council members, it would help us um, if those uh, water savings numbers could be broken down just a little bit more uh, to see what kind of savings we're truly seeing. Thank you. That's a great suggestion. Thank you, Councilman. Aaron? Uh, uh, I yes. Uh, Sorry. Oh. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, so, uh, yes, we, we definitely recognize that it's, uh, uh, you know, as I was mentioning before, actually, Nobody knows your residents better than <laughs> than you, and also the one size fits all approach to the county is, is kind of a is a, is a difficult one. And we, we understand that that um, you know messaging and making sure we can get uh, you know how we get how we reach the residents, how we reach the actually the businesses, and and how we work on some of those. And and understanding also um, you know for us the the initial call was that we were new, we were short on water, but then 2019, 2020, uh, in some areas like you said. You know, some for COVID, the water use went down. Some for COVID, the water use went up, uh, depending on which area you're in. I, I'd like to, uh, Ms. Uh, Struve, I, I was wondering if you had any uh, follow-up thoughts on this. Sure. Thank you, Aaron. I'm Kirsten Struve, Assistant Officer for Water Supply. So just um, because we talked about outdoor water use a lot, we, we chose 2019 because it was um, a still pre-drought year. It wasn't dry yet. And because we see our use outdoors increase a lot during droughts, that's that's why we did a 2019 call. Um, and uh, I believe that our data didn't really show countywide anyway, a big difference um, in water use, um, you know, between the COVID, but uh, it may for individual cities, of course. Um, but yeah, the reason we chose 2019 was because it was pre-drought or maybe at least in between droughts. Yeah. Great. Uh, another uh, Vice Mayor uh, Hendricks. Yes, Vice Mayor. Yeah, yeah hello, thank you. So I'd like Good to follow evening. on a little bit to Mayor Klein's comment. And yes. I'd like to ask a little bit about subsidence. Yes. And, you know, subsidence has to do with how much water is being taken out of the ground and availability of water. But it also has a big impact to infrastructure that's in the ground. And so I'm kind of curious if there are any kind of forecasts or estimates. If we stay on the current state of usage, and if we're not seeing a change in the amount of water coming to us, so if we're in just steady state, at what point does subsidence start to become an issue, and in particular in North County? You do keep track of that, Vanessa. Yes, uh, hello again. So yes, yeah, subsidence historically has been a very major issue in the northern yes. portion of the county, including Sunnyvale, which historically had seven to eight feet of permanent subsidence. Um, or sinking of the land surface that will never get back, it's irreversible. Um, the good news is because of all the huge investments that we've made over time in reservoirs and imported water, um, permanent subsidence was effectively halted around 1970. But because of the huge impact, like you mentioned, damage to underground infrastructure, um, it can cause uh, seawater intrusion, flooding risk, the cost of the communities are enormous. So we're very vigilant and continuing to monitor that. We have extensive benchmark surveys that we do every year. We actually have one of our key monitoring points is in Sunnyvale. 
uh, at the 101 237 interchange. We have wells that we monitor in terms of water levels, and we're very conservative in our approach because we want to make sure that we absolutely minimize the risk of permanent subsidence. So to get to your question about if we continue on the current trend, what will that mean? Um, if, if we still are seeing these kind of declines into next year, that's part of the reason why we called for the shortage condition, because we're very concerned that you know, as soon as next year, we could be approaching some of those subsidence thresholds that we've established to minimize the risk. Part of the challenge of subsidence is that you can't necessarily tell if it's elastic, you know, if it's recoverable or permanent until you get to the other side of it. We, we do have changes in the land surface that happen every year and even seasonally. So we do see some uplift and some compaction. Um, certainly we're seeing some compaction in the benchmark data that we're seeing. Um, but we saw that during the last drought too. And so the issue is if you can recover your water levels soon enough, uh, that damage won't be permanent. So that's, but again, we don't necessarily know while we're in it. So we're taking proactive action now to try to prevent that from happening and again, minimize any risk of that. Yeah, and my concern right now is not permanent damage. It's that it's temporary and I'm even less worried about seawater coming in I'm more worried about what it means to, you know, fresh water pipes in the ground, dirty water pipes in the ground, and all the other infrastructure that's in the ground that can be damaged with temporary problems. And I think I heard you say in your, your comments, next year, if things stay steady state, next year is the issue here. We're not looking at a two or three year horizon. This is, it's a potentially a problem next year. Is that, did I understand you correctly? That's correct, and that's why, I mean, we're really pushing for water use reduction because that's how we can improve the situation by reducing the stress on the basin and keeping our groundwater levels in a healthy state. Yeah, I'll just make one other comment that from my perspective, because I thought I heard one of the previous speakers say, you know, it takes nine months for when we ask the public to make a change to try and where we actually see the full result of that. Um, I'm all for you guys making, you know, requests of changes much sooner. Um, I don't, you know, I think we're looking at a serious problem for next year, potentially. And again, the infrastructure, because if something happens to any of our infrastructure in the ground, it's very, very expensive to repair um, for what goes on. And so I think, you know, we, I would encourage us trying to be ahead of the curve of asking for whatever changes we need to do to make sure we provide enough water, but make sure there is no, 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 temporary even subsidence that happens um, in North County. So those are just my thoughts. Thank you, Councilman. Yeah, did you? I yeah. have no other hands raised. Uh, Dr. Santos? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair uh, Hendricks. I totally concur with you. Uh, <clears throat> Chief um, Baker did a great presentation and many other inputs of uh, Mayor Klein and so on. But the other issue is this, just like with COVID-19, it comes at a point where you have to be more restrictive and start doing enforcement and whatever have you. And I totally agree with you. This is where it's coming to. Not that we're enforcement powerful here, but the issue is we have to educate so on. And then when that doesn't work, we've got to continue with metering all the water use. And then we have our legal staff looking at potential enforcement. We've got to do more. And it's, it's not going to be easy, but like you said, if we continue waiting nine months, you're going to have subsidence and some very, very hard issues that we have to face even more so. And the last thing is when you all get an opportunity on October 23rd at 9 o'clock, we're having a, a um, kind of a workshop with everybody to see if we can be more consistent and try to encourage everybody to use water wisely and, and use it properly and not waste it and so on. That's going to be a workshop here out of there at uh, Tony, I think you're chairing that October 23rd at 9 yes. o'clock. So we invite everybody to, to join us, and your ideas will definitely be uh, considered there, and we need them more. But the strong point is this, working together, and then when people are not, what are we going to do? Well, we've got to do more than just say, well, that's a slap on the wrist. We've got to do more things. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, no more questions. Then we'll move on to our next item. Uh, take it back to uh, our CEO. All right, good evening again. Um, moving to the next item for item 2.2, um, infrastructure projects like our advanced purified water project were critical for our water supply in the face of droughts and climate change and the current drought is making it 
um, obvious that our reported water supplies are less certain, which makes our proposed projects uh, like our advanced purified water projects even more important. And we're happy to work with cities like Sunnyvale towards win-win solutions uh, for the entire county. So with that, I'm going to turn over to Kristen Struve to uh, take it away and talk about an update on our Valley Water Purified Water Program. Kristen, good afternoon. Good evening. Thank you so much, um, CEO Calendar and Chair Stramera. I'll be giving an update on the Purified Water Project and um, as well as the Countywide Water Reuse Master Plan. And we discussed both of those issues um, in, in detail also at the Joint Committee meeting. Um, so as we had just talked about, this is also a graph that shows uh, what happened to groundwater levels in Santa Clara County. Um, with uh, and land surface elevation with population growth and increased pumping. And that is why we're, um, you know, moving forward with the Purified Water Project. Um, because it is one way we can help um, the groundwater stay healthy. And you've seen a slide before from NIDA, um, but uh, now we're going to focus on the fact that recycled water at this moment is 5% of the uh, water supplies, 5% of the water and it is um, purple pipe water, so that is non-potable water. Um, and we would like to increase that. Our board has set a policy to increase it to 10% of recycled and purified. And the difference between recycled and purified is recycled water is basically treated wastewater um, and, and is used for landscape irrigation and industrial purposes. Purified water uh, has additional treatment uh, and is then suitable for drinking purposes. And this is the type of technology and the type of project we're talking about. Um, we would uh, add microfiltration, reverse osmosis, and um, UV light disinfection and advanced oxidation to the treatment of recycled water and then convey it to our groundwater recharge ponds. Specifically, we're looking at a project in either San Jose or Palo Alto with 18 to 20 miles of uh, conveyance, uh, including a pipe through Sunnyvale. Uh, if the Palo Alto play, um, site is chosen, and then um, conveyance to the Los Gatos recharge system, which is our largest recharge system. And here's a close-up of that system. Um, and basically what this project would do is um, release water into these ponds, which currently receive both local and imported water. And so integrate the supply together, um, and then it uh, goes into the groundwater and can be pumped up from there. And this is called indirect potable reuse. Our timeline is for our board to make a decision on the project site, either Palo Alto or San Jose, um, and then award the project next year to a private partner. We're using a public-private partnership, um, so a private entity will design, build, finance, operate, and maintain um, the purified water project, uh, but Valley Water will um, retain ownership, and then we hope to have construction complete and water flowing by 2028. We're also doing an environmental impact report uh, and had a scoping meeting back in March, and any impacts and mitigations, including for construction, will be identified in that EIR. This is the first phase of the countywide reuse master plan that we worked on together uh, with all our wastewater partners in the county which is the you know guiding uh, will be our guiding document to implement um, additional recycled water and purified water projects and we very much thank sunnyvale staff for participating in that project um, they were one of the important partners um, in developing the countywide reuse master plan that was just adopted by our board and that master plan also looks at how this initial phase of um, our purified water project can be expanded in the future, including with water from Sunnyvale, and how we could also integrate once regulations are available, direct potable reuse, meaning um, putting that water uh, into pipes or into treatment plants. That's my update, and I'm um, open for any questions. Thank you, Kirsten. And I, and I, should, and I should mention uh, that we have, of course, a, uh, a joint committee of... Uh, Valley uh, va of uh, Valley Water directors and um, and uh, Sunnyvale City Council members. Uh, we ha hadn't met for a while, but we did meet this past month. 
Uh, we expect to continue to meet on a more regular basis, especially since uh, we are uh, uh, being ambitious about expanding our purification uh, center uh, and also uh, determining where to site uh, the next phase of uh, water purification. Uh, we have committed and will continue to uh, maintain communication very steady with, the, with uh, uh, Sunnyvale City Council. Um, we um, are committed to making sure that we keep you up on every phase of the project where we are uh, where, wh what we're planning and so on uh, to make sure that you as our partners are always up to uh, the information where we are and are always included in the decision making regarding recycle uh, and water purification and all of our efforts. Uh, comments, oh, any uh, public comment and then we'll go to our members. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have no uh, public comment at this time. Okay, great. I, I do so, have Council Member Melton and has his hand. Yes, Council Member Melton. Yes, thank yes, you, sir. Chair. Uh, Russ Melton here from Sunnyvale City Council. Yes. And I'll, I'll first and foremost say it's a real privilege, I feel, to be part of the Joint Recycled Water Subcommittee. And um, Chair, as you noted, a couple of weeks ago, we had a subcommittee meeting consisting of Council Member Larson and myself yes. from the Sunnyvale side. And uh, of course, the very knowledgeable uh, Valley Water board members. And I'll be happy to defer to uh, my esteemed colleague, Councilmember Larson, because he's the vice chair of the of the committee. Yes. Um, so uh, Gustav, of course, will chime in if he has any thoughts about the subcommittee meeting. But I just wanted to say, uh, first and foremost, it is absolutely clear to me that Valley Water desires to have an exceptional relationship with the city of Sunnyvale. Uh, as Valley Water goes through its decisioning process about advanced water treatment facilities, uh, where the volume exists, whether that be, whether that's San Jose or Palo Alto, and Palo Alto of course has other municipalities that feed into yeah. its um, sewer treatment plant. I know for a fact that Valley Water will um, get to a decision on that. Um, and then uh, I learned during the subcommittee meeting um, how important it is for Sunnyvale and Valley Water to have a good relationship uh, because there could be a point in the future where Sunnyvale's water pollution control plant also becomes a contributor to the grand scheme of recycled water and you know that our um what our, our uh, wastewater treated to an appropriate level could find its way to the recharge ponds and whether that happens in a year or five years or 15 years well that that answer will become clear in, in due course uh, i think that would be an incredible uh, accomplishment for sunnyvale for the region and i applaud valley waters um leadership and and all of that so i just felt like i wanted to to say that um, the, the other thing that I'm reminded of, because the presentation that we just saw had a really helpful visualization graphic of subsidence over time. Um, and so I'm just going to echo on to what my colleague, Vice Chair Glenn Hendricks, was saying about whether it's temporary or permanent subsidence. Um, it's one of those things that gives me a real sense of anxiousness and urgency um, to any extent that Valley Water wants to turn the knob uh, more to the right in terms of well water usage and all the complexities that are involved in that uh, and turn the knob to the right in terms of education or when appropriate to enforcement uh, or how to accelerate recharging the groundwater supplies. It's a, uh, I'm just here to say I concur. It's a really important topic. Um, and while the risk may not be um, out there in the in the community, that maybe could be part of or understood by the community, they're out there. And that could be part of the, the um, education efforts um, that Valley Water considers undertaking, which is, you know, there, there's not only a water risk, but educating the public on the subsidence risk and why this is, is such a big deal. Um, uh, I also have some other minor thoughts that I've, I've shared with my city manager in terms of, you know, 
the water pollution control plant in Sunnyvale and its potential role in all of this. But for now, I'll turn off my microphone um, and perhaps my esteemed colleague, Councilmember Larson, Vice Chair of the subcommittee might have a chance to speak next. That's it for now. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Councilmember yes. Larson has yes. a Yes, Councilmember Larson. Yes, thank you, Chair. Yes, and thank you, Councilmember Melton, for uh, kicking things off here. Um, I, I was very appreciative of the joint me meeting that we had with Valley Water uh, several weeks ago on this topic. Um, we had a very good discussion about yes. um, Valley Water's goals and opportunities and the challenges that um, I think that um, it takes to actually bring projects yeah. like this to fruition. And I think we're all coming to realize that uh, wastewater effluent is an increasingly valuable resource um, and is going to play a, a bigger and bigger role in uh, water reliability um, in this area. The um, treating wastewater really is a, a drought proof supply, if you will. Um, but there are also significant uh, challenges, technical <clears throat> challenges, regulatory challenges, financial challenges. Um, and I applaud Valley Water for, um, for the detailed efforts that you've made to date on coming up with a comprehensive plan uh, for how to move mm -hmm. forward on uh, recycled water within the county. Um, and I know that Sunnyvale would um, very much uh, would look forward to a chance to, uh, to work with you to have our effluent um, be part of that program. And I also understand that these projects take time and are complex. Um, and so I don't envy you your task of balancing all the, the, the different considerations. But, um, you know, it, my perspective is it's not a question of if the effluent will be used for purified water. It's just a question of when and how we get there. Um, and uh, I, I'm appreciative of the ongoing partnership that we do have with Valley Water, and I want to maintain that that good relationship, um, so that when the time is right, um, we can explore further opportunities. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Larson. Councilmember Fall. Councilmember. Yes. Just want to say thank you to staff for the, the great presentation, and um, I, I would agree with my colleagues. Uh, you know, Sunnyvale, I'm sure, would love to be a partner on this project and it's just a question of when versus uh, if it will happen. So the question I had is on slide eight, you mentioned that fall 2021, the board would decide on a project site. So essentially choosing a partner, is that correct? Um, yes, it would be choosing between Palo Alto and um, San Jose, depending on the status of negotiations. It may, um, you know, be, later in the year, more like winter, um, because we just started um, having discussions with San Jose again. Uh, that's what I thought, because I think the uh, early last month, the, the San Jose City Council at the Rules Committee passed a memorandum to reopen negotiations with the city of San Jose, targeting a completion of the negotiations with the mediator by January 2022. Is that correct? That's correct. That's great. Great. So I, it, yeah, I just wanted to clarify, it won't be fall, it will most likely be early winter. Um, and, and so just the question for me is, will we want to have another discussion like the one we're having today, but more in depth on the actual potential project? And I'm, I'm assuming the, the subcommittee that my colleagues sit on are, are discussing the components of what a project agreement would look like. But could you just walk me through now through the end of January, if, if the Valley Water was uh, interested in a project with the city of Sunnyvale, how that would come to fruition and how that might be another public hearing that would be hosted? We, we expect, uh, Councilman Fung, we, we expect to have uh, another meeting of, of our joint committee uh, before the end of the calendar year. So I think we were talking about at least the winter, whether it's November or so. so uh, that's what I meant. We made a commitment to make sure that uh, that the committee was active and uh, was completely engaged and, and uh, that we shared everything that was going on with the committee so that if there's any opportunities to do anything different, um, the city of Sunnyvale will be engaged with us. Uh, so certainly before the winter, we'll have uh, the actual committee will meet 
Uh, and, uh, you know, we will share where we are at that point. And then, of course, um, we'll continue to meet, which means we'll probably meet again either in January or February. Uh, the, the, our joint committee will then meet again. Uh, so we expect to keep you up on a very regular basis on what's going on and get feedback from you. This is a true partnership, so uh, that's why I mentioned that we will be actively meeting again uh, because we're at a point where we're going to be making some pretty long-term decisions, and we want, want to make sure that all our partners are involved. Fantastic. Thank you. That, that concludes my questions. I, I greatly appreciate the insight that the chair and staff has provided. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Next. I have a Council Member Melton. Yes. Councilman Melton. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, um, Chair Estramera. Um, just to just to put a ribbon and a bow on on my comments, um, I'm looking forward uh, personally to the ongoing conversation with uh, Valley Water. I think the um, the last meeting um, was uh, tremendously helpful, and as Valley Water Chair goes through its process of making um, what what I think will be a very difficult decision to make and. Clearly, there's a lot of um, heavy discussions going on. Um, the, the funny thing is uh, that we had um, the subcommittee meeting uh, that was relatively close time-wise to this meeting that we're having right now. And, and that's just an interesting function of the, of the calendar. And I, I would commit, and I'm, I'm sure that my colleague, Council Member Larson, would also agree. We have plenty of opportunities once we have a subcommittee meeting, like we did a couple of weeks ago, yeah. to share with our colleagues at the end of our routine council meeting. So if there's any desire whatsoever uh, by Council Member Fong or any of the other esteemed council members to get you know virtual real-time updates on what we've discussed at the subcommittee meeting, well, of course we have a process for that. And um, so I felt like I just wanted to, to share that notion, Chair. Um, and I, I also wanted to circle back because I think it's um, a really important concept that Council Member Larson brought up. It's, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And uh, uh, this is not the first drought in my lifetime. I was born and raised in Palo Alto, so I remember the, yeah. the, the droughts in 1970s. And so this is part of life in California and in Silicon Valley. And um, I, I agree with the sense that I get from Valley Water that it's time to take further control of our supply of water and the sewer effluent and purification um, is a huge part of that. Um, thank you for the second opportunity to speak. Thank you, Councilman. And as I mentioned previously uh, at, to, at the joint committee meeting, we have, uh, as you, uh, some of you know, we have issued an RFQ for, a, for our private partner. Uh, and we've gotten, I believe it's eight responses. So there's an awful lot of activity and interest in joining us as private partners. So um, we're moving along all the way around. Uh, we will uh, be meeting again soon uh, with Palo Alto where our staffs are meeting on a regular basis, but our joint committee uh, uh, meeting is coming up. So uh, all of the activity is, is moving very quickly. As I mentioned previously, uh, you know, we're already looking at the advent of a pretty extensive um, infrastructure program from the federal government. Uh, I know things are going on, but we all know how this works. You know, everybody's got to be involved. Uh, this is a long negotiation, but I'm sure in the end that we're going to have a pretty extensive infrastructure uh, program, well-funded, uh, that will include a lot of the issues that we're talking about today. There will be, uh, I think, a lot of water projects uh, will be supported and included, as well as recycling uh, uh, projects that will be uh, right at the forefront of the infrastructure projects, and the state will also be considering that. So I think we're moving in the right direction and we've got the timetable i think you know we have to stick to the timetable uh so that we can be effective be ready and prepared when we get those funding opportunities we want to take advantage of them so we're all moving and all of our partners are right there with us and i think you know for our joint constituents we are we are doing the very best that we can but we are absolutely delivering uh, and we'll keep this pace going, uh, and, uh, and like I mentioned, we'll keep you up on it. So uh, 
thank you for the discussion. There's no motion required for this informational report. So now I'll turn the floor over to Mayor Klein for the next item. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I now want to introduce Sunnyvale City Manager, Kent Steffens, who will be introducing city staff for our next item on the Sunnyvale Clean Water Program. Okay. Kent? Uh, thank you, Mayor, and good evening, Council members and Valley Water Board members. Um, the Sunnyvale Clean Water Program is our long-term uh, program to replace our wastewater treatment plant. And so we started planning for this more than 10 years ago with conditions assessments that then led into master planning, environmental review, and design. We're now nearly done with construction of our first large project to replace the primary treatment system. And we're gonna continue with this program for probably the next 20 or 30 years. Um, but for more details, I'm pleased to introduce Romana Chinakotla, uh, our Sunnydale Director of Environmental Services, and also Chip Taylor, our Director of Public Works, who will give you a presentation with an update on the Clean Water Program. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good evening, Sunnydale good Council evening. members and Valley Water Board members. I'm Romana Chinakotla. I'm the Director of Environmental Services for the City of Sunnyvale. I'm joined um, by Chip Taylor, who is a director of public works, and we will be jointly making this presentation. Um, David, my first slide. All right. So um, the Sunnyvale Clean Water Program, um, as our city manager mentioned, is a series of projects that together um, essentially rebuild our water pollution control plan or our wastewater treatment plan. Um, next slide. Um, this is an aerial view of our um, water pollution control plan. Um, you see the actual main plan at the bottom of your screen. Um, you have two big ponds. They are about 440 acres in size. They're actually part of the treatment process. Um, and they provide biological treatment for the plant. Um, one of the, um, the uh, key aspects of this plant is that it's, it's a very old plant. It's, it was built in 1956, and it's undergone multiple upgrades. Um, it, it provides tertiary treatment level treatment for the wastewater that comes in here. Um, it was designed and permitted um, for about 30 million gallons a day. And on an average day, we get about 12 to 30 million gallons a day during dry weather. And it serves a population of about 155,000, um, in addition to the um, daytime population that comes into San Diego. Um, it, it discharges into the San Francisco Bay. The plant itself is located in the northern part of Sunnyvale. Um, you know, at the, at the corner of Caribbean Drive and Borregas. And um, so the discharge from the plant is pretty much directly into Guadalupe Slough and then into the, um, into the South Bay. Uh, in addition to the wastewater treatment, the plant is also equipped to produce uh, recycled water. We produce about 250 million gallons of recycled water every year. Um, next slide. So this is a, a close-up view of the actual plant itself. Uh, on the left side, you see the actual existing facilities, um, and these are currently operational. Uh, and this is how we actually treat our wastewater that comes in today. On the right side, you actually see some construction that's going on. This is a, a, a photograph that's a little dated. Um, um, you actually see the primary treatment uh, plant and headworks and the construction. Um, that project is almost complete, and it, is, it will be actually, uh, we'll be bringing it online uh, in March of next year. Next slide. So the, the, the Sunnyvale Clean Water Program started, um, our project really started with a condition assessment in 2006. Um, as part of the condition assessment, there were several structures and assets that were identified as needing immediate rehabilitation. And um, so based on this, the city actually implemented several rehab projects. Uh, this was followed by 
um, a strategic infrastructure plan, which gave us a high level view of some of the things that we needed to do to bring the plant um, to, um, to the latest 20th century standards, um, the 21st century standards. And um, this was followed up by a more detailed master plan. Um, and the master plan itself uh, was adopted by the city council in um, 2016. Next slide. So the purpose of the clean water program, these are some of the drivers that we had to keep in mind or we kept in mind as we developed our master plan. The, the, the biggest one is to comply with the latest regulatory standards. We also knew that there were some new standards that were coming down um, through the water board in terms of our nutrient discharge standards. So we wanted to comply with all those new standards, extend the life of some of the facilities that um, we were going to still keep, um, keep the plant safe and dry, obviously. And um, important, a very important factor was to keep, by, to optimize the cost of the project. So the impact on the rate payers was minimized. And then lastly, we also wanted to improve the reliability of the power supply. Next slide. So the mass, the, 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 the master plan overall identified close to 30 projects. Um, a series of these projects, one of them is right now in a construction and then that'll be followed by other projects for um, close to 30 years. Um, and as, as, as you can imagine, this is basically um, a very expensive project or a program um, close to a billion dollars. This, in fact, will be the largest um, project in Sunnyvale's, largest CIP project in Sunnyvale's history. Um, we have been able to, we have been successful in getting loans, low interest loans, SR loans for the primary treatment project and also an additional VIFIA loan and um, another SRF loan for our um, secondary treatment, solids handling and other projects. Um, so I'm going to basically stop here and um, Chip is going to go over some of the specific projects that we are currently working on and we will be working on in the next few years. Chip? Great, thank you very much and thanks for having us tonight. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide and I'll get started. So this slide, uh, it shows the treatment plant again, kind of a, a plan view of the treatment plant, the same view that you saw in the aerial photograph before. Uh, most of the current plant is over to the left side of the slide. And then where we're doing a lot of the construction right now is over to the right side. Uh, the projects that we have um, either ongoing right now or coming up in the near future. Um, we have the primary project in purple there. Uh, so that's the one that's currently under construction. Um, and I'll give you a timeline of all these projects a little bit later in the presentation, uh, but that one's nearing completion. Um, and then I'll jump to the middle, because that's gonna be our next one, is called our site prep package. Um, and that one is actually doing a lot of underground utilities of moving them around, kind of moving a lot of things out of the way so that we can do a lot of the other projects. So we split that out so we can kind of get ahead of some of the other projects that we're working on. Um, and then we have in the uh, kind of orangish color and the pink color over on the far left and far right, we have our secondary project that we'll be doing. So all of our secondary treatment will be done there. And then our rehab project is in pink is basically through the condition assessments and the master plan, uh, we determined that there were certain components within the facility itself that didn't necessarily need to be rebuilt, uh, but just rehabilitated. And so we'll be doing a lot of work over in there and they'll be going on more or less the same time frame. And then in the blue is the clean water center. So that would be a new kind of admin and laboratory building that would be constructed as well as a maintenance facility, a partial maintenance facility. Um, and that one is currently not funded, um, but we are hopeful that we'll be able to find some funding uh, through some of the loans that we received and some other sources. So we're currently actively looking to try to fund that particular project but we've already taken the plans to 90% on that. Um, and we hope to continue with that. Next slide. And then I've just got some photos here just to kind of show you some of the projects and what's going on. So this is the primary project and this is the primary headworks facility. So our, our giant hole in the ground uh, that we have for uh, everything that's coming into the plant. Next slide. 
This is actually a kind of a rendering of the Clean Water Center. So the new uh, administration laboratory maintenance building that would be constructed uh, right near the entrance uh, of the facility. Uh, we would tear down the existing much older building and then we would put this building in its place more or less. Next slide. Then we do have our perimeter wall for flood protection. Um, and what's really uh, great about this wall as a portion of it, we're actually working with Valley Water. So we've had a great relationship. Uh, you were already looking to build a wall along some of the channels there and our wall was gonna be right next to it. So we said, well, well let's work together and try to combine this into one wall. Um, and so we've made some great progress on that. So that's a good, um, good collaboration that is taking place right now. Next slide. So this is the construction schedule, at least over the next five years or so. Uh, you can see a lot of these projects are on top of each other. We're gonna have a lot of activity. The primary Headworks project by itself was very busy. With these other projects in play, it's gonna be a very active construction site for a while. Um, so you can see the primary Headworks project is um, nearing completion. We still have about nine more months or so uh, before that will be complete. complete. Um, we do have that site prep package, a lot of that underground utility work and everything that's going to be done. That just was recently awarded and so it'll be under construction or just about start construction here. Um, and that'll go through 23 for a big portion of uh, 2023. Then we have the secondary uh, project. That's one of our big, big projects, as well as that plant rehab, doing some of the rehabilitation of some components of the plant. Um, both of those will start about mid next year, maybe toward the fall of next year, just depending on how award of the contract works. Um, and then they'll be going uh, ongoing for several years uh, for both of those projects. Rehab is a little bit shorter in time frame. Uh, the perimeter wall project would start in 23 and go through a portion of 24. Um, and so again, that's a portion of that is the joint wall between with Valley and uh, Valley Water and uh, Sunnydale. And then there's a pipe, pipeline rehab. Some of the, uh, we recently had a pipe that broke out there and we had to put some temporary measures in place. So as part of that, we rec recognize that there may be some pipes that need to be replaced in that portion. So that's another project that we're currently working on. Um, and that wouldn't start until 2024. It's a little bit smaller project, uh, but an important project. And then you see at the very bottom, starting in uh, kind of toward the fall of 2023, is the Clean Water Center. So that would be the admin lab and uh, maintenance building. Uh, again, we don't currently have funding for that, but again, we are very hopeful that we'll be able to find that funding. And then that's how that would fit in. So we're trying to do a lot of things now that would allow that to slip in if we do find the full funding for that particular project. And with that, I'll hand it back over to Ramana to finish the presentation. Thank you, Chip. Um, so um, our master plan is already six years old. So um, next year we are basically um, we are basically doing an update of our master plan, just re-looking at some of the things that um, were approved in the last master plan. Um, one of the key items that we are really excited about is um, the, the Sunnyvale is one of the few cities that actually stores separates our food. Um, so we get about 8,000 tons of food waste that comes to our um, smart station food, pro uh, smart station waste processing facility. So um, that is a great source of energy um, and we can use that food waste um, to um, digest it in our uh, anaerobic digesters in the wastewater plant. Um, and we are hoping to provide another, another energy source for the plant. Um, so that's something that we'll be studying as part of this master plan update. Um, we also, you will be seeing another presentation on our Moffett Park specific plan, um, which is an area very close to the plant. Um, and that is looking at um, some um, substantial growth. Um, so that growth, um, you would have to also look at how it affects the wastewater treatment plant capacity. So that's something that we'll be looking at um, we're also going to be looking at some of the secondary treatment alternatives. Um, we are um, currently close to doing the first phase of our secondary treatment. Um, and we also have another phase. So as we go with the second phase, we're going to be looking at um, intensification and other options that improve the treatment quality um, and quantity. Order management is another aspect that we'll be looking at. 
Um, we know that the air district now has more uh, stringent requirements as it relates to air quality. So that's something that our master plan needs to address going forward. Sea level rise and um, also PFAS and biosolids disposal uh, are other um, things that we'll be looking at in this master plan. Um, next slide. So, so that concludes our presentation and um, and I will be uh, happy to answer any questions um, our, uh, the board of directors has or council members. Okay. Uh, I'll first go ahead and move to the public. So I'll open the public uh, hearing on this item. Uh, since we remain in a virtual setting, I'll ask the public to use the virtual raised hand button or dial star nine on your telephone to indicate that they wish to speak. The clerk uh, will then unmute your microphone when it's your turn to address city council and the district board. Speakers will be given three minutes to speak. Uh, board clerk, do we have any members of the public wishing to speak on this item? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have no hands raised at this time. Okay, I'll close the public hearing and bring it back to uh, the board and council. Oh, are, are there any questions or comments from the board or council? Uh, excuse me, Mr. Mayor, I'm sorry. This is the clerk. Oh, oh never mind. Should you, I had somebody raise their hand. Oh, there we go. I did have a member of the public raise their hand as soon as you started to close. Would you like me yeah, to? Go ahead and reopen okay. and let Gita speak. Okay. Uh, uh, Gita Dev. Thank you, Mayor Klein. Thank you, staff. Uh, my question is, uh, I'm, I'm really asking this question as a private citizen. Um, that was a wonderful presentation and was uh, extremely informative about the wastewater treatment. I have a few questions that I would like to pose. Um, one is that I noticed that in Menlo Park, in order to move some of their facility away from sea level rise, they have installed a uh, satellite facility up in uh, Sharon Heights to capture some of the water around in that residential area and use it in, in that case, in a golf course. And they have recycled water of about 180 million gallons per year. And I was wondering if the master plan looking forward to sea level rise, whether that might be something that is a strategy that uh, public works may be thinking about um, you know, maybe in 50 years, by that time, we need to be planning to be moving uphill with satellite facilities. That was one question. And the second was, with sea level rise, we've noticed that in some other facilities like Oral Loma, I think maybe even South San Francisco may be thinking about it, is to for tertiary treatment of water. They were looking at combining nature-based adaptation for polishing the water for reuse. Um, using sort of uh, sort of ecotone levy type things where it's very gentle slope, but it's planted with uh, native vegetation and the water is filtered to uh, the final polishing is done for the water and on that slope um, in, in order to then reuse that water. And I was just wondering whether those were sort of adaptation resilience ideas that we were looking at because obviously we are very concerned when we see this, you know, with walls all around it and the sea levels rising around it, sort of like a bathtub ultimately. Uh, so just wondering about that. The questions that I would love to hear from the staff at some point. Thank you so much for the opportunity and for the presentation. Very good presentation. Thank you, Gita. Um, and we'll make sure that, that Staff gets those comments and, and you know, feeding, looking at what other cities is, do, is doing is always useful. Thank you. And so with that, we will again close the public hearing and come bring it back to uh, the board and the council. Are there any comments or questions from council or the board? I see none. I just want to thank staff for the presentation. Uh, definitely, for, uh, uh, this is the biggest project that the city has done in its history. And definitely, you know, as we move forward, uh, how, we, how we schedule that, how we fund that is, has been, let's say, a, a feat um, of effort 
from city staff and I appreciate their hard work in making sure that all the pieces uh, are, are able to be done pretty much almost simultaneously to, to a large degree. But, but also the critical thing has been getting you know, uh, the appropriate funding, which has ultimately saved us quite a bit of money in the long run. So, so I, I give kudos to staff as far as that's concerned. Um, Council Member Melton, you have a comment? Yeah, and I'll, I'll just jump in behind you, Mayor, because I agree with everything you said. And I heard Ramana talk about Sunnyvale's food cycle program uh, very briefly. And my colleagues have heard me say this. I think food cycle in Sunnyvale has been an outrageous success. Uh, and this is where Sunnyvale residents self-separate uh, their food cycleable products, uh, corn cobs and eggshells and coffee grounds. Uh, and to make a long story short, that keeps all that garbage from going into Kirby Canyon. And instead it's separated for other uses, uh, including potentially going into an anaerobic digester at the water pollution control plant uh, to be turned into additional energy. So um, I felt like I wanted to chime in right after you spoke, Mayor Klein, about um, all the wonderful things about food cycle and how it's lowered cost for our residents. So thank you very much. Thank you. So I see no other comments from the district board or from council. So we will go ahead and move on to, oh, actually, no, I now pass it back to Chair Estramera for the next item. Thank you, Mayor Klein. Uh, we'll move on over to uh, 2.4 update on Sunnyvale East-West Flood Channels Protection Project. And I'll hand it over to the CEO. All right, thank you, Chair Estramera. Um, as both the board and council likely know, the voters of Santa Clara County have been very generous in voting multiple times over the last 20 years to fund flood protection projects in Santa Clara County. And one of those projects also is the Sunnyvale East and West project, which also was partially funded through the Safe Clean Water Fund. And the good news is that this project is expected to be completed in FY24. And it's important to note that once this project is completed, FEMA will reevaluate the floodplain it will likely remove residents from the floodplain, which will remove the requirements that they pay for flood insurance. And projects like these are important, especially right now, because after, dr after droughts, the number and magnitude of floods increase because the ground is too dry, can't absorb rain fast enough, so water flows of the land, flooding surrounding areas. So it's really important that we're able to complete these projects timely. I'd like to now introduce Deputy Operating Officer Rochelle Blank, and she's going to co-present with engineering unit manager, Steve Ferranti. So I'll turn this over to uh, DOO Blank. Uh, thank you, CEO uh, Calendar. Yes, Rochelle Blank, Deputy Operating Officer of Watersheds Design and Construction Division. And I am accompanied this evening with uh, Stephen Ferrante, engineering unit manager. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we will uh, run through a presentation. Okay, uh, Stephen, are you on? Yes, evening everyone. So uh, next slide, please. So I'm gonna give you a first a little uh, overview of the project. Um, if you're not familiar with the Sunnyvale East and West channels, they were constructed by the district in the 1960s. And we've had uh, flooding on the, uh, both channels in 1963, 68, 83, 86, and 98, 98 was uh, very significant, and I'll have a photo later on about the flooding there. Um, the project is funded by State Clean Water, and it's fully funded. Um, and the design is complete. Uh, the It's about a total of nine miles long. The west channel is approximately two and a half miles, and the east channel is approximately six and a half miles. Next, please. Okay, so uh, we submitted our, our permit applications to the resource agencies in June, 2017. Seems like a long time ago, but a lot's happened between uh, now and June, 2017. One of the things that came about was, and I'll talk a little bit later on, was um, Google came to the district, district management about a enhancement project uh, associated with their development that could enhance a portion of the West Channel. And so we pursued that, and I will uh, talk about that later in the presentation. As far as the permanent right-of-way acquisition, that's been complete, and it's been complete for several years. Uh, I do want to thank the city for, for that, because the city, there were several parcels that the city owned that uh, the project 
required for construction. Uh, there are some temporary construction areas that are pending, and, and the only reason they're pending is because we haven't had have a set uh, start date for the construction. Uh, we already have uh, executed a trail cost sharing agreement and a joint use agreement with the city of Sunnyvale. We also have a Bay, Bay Trail cost sharing agreement complete with Google. And the construction contract is planned sometime in 2022. Next slide, please. So here's the photo of the flooding in 1998. Uh, that's Caribbean Drive. You're looking south on Crossman Avenue. So quite significant. Next slide, please. So this is just a typical section of the West Channel. Like I said, that they are acting as storm drains. There is no natural watershed that was here before. They were constructed to alleviate uh, uh, localized flooding and uh, to, uh, and that was caused by a lot by subsidence. So very narrow channel. And this is from Carl Road looking south towards Caribbean Drive. Next slide, please. So this is the East Channel, a little bit wider. Um, and you can see the reason I, I chose this slide is one of the, one of the competing interests here in this right away is you can see the bases of the pg e transmission towers. And uh, this channel, like I said, was constructed in the 60s and, and um, it follows an alignment where it kind of avoids the foundations for these, uh, the pg e transmissions and it requires this concrete lining. And what that does is doesn't do well for the natural banks because uh, the water gets diverted from one bank to the other and to go around these tower foundations and the concrete speeds up the velocities and you see the erosion type of uh, situation we have along the banks. Um, the project will solve, besides the flood protection, uh, increase the level to a 100 year protection. It will address these erosion sites. Next slide, please. So the, the the project on the downstream of 101 on the east channel from 101 to the bay, uh, we will have flood walls. On the west channel from Matilda Avenue to the bay, we'll have flood walls. Um, they're either on the outboard side or inboard side, um, and they kind of alternate on, on because of different locations uh, in the uh, along the reaches. Um, and it, like I said, it, the uh, flood walls will provide 100-year provide protection, and they meet uh, FEMA floodboards. FEMA free board standards. Um, the vertical heights of the walls range from one foot at the very upstream limit to approximately seven and a half feet above existing ground in the downstream area. And the bridge head walls at Caribbean will have um, a graphic arts that uh, artwork that's already been uh, reviewed by the city and form liners on the flood walls. Next slide, please. This is kind of a typical section of the uh, East Channel where we have the erosion and uh, so we'll be putting rock slope protection in at the invert and then filling in uh, two foot of native fill at the bottom of the invert. So the RSP, which is rock slope protection design is, is pending with the resource agencies, specifically the Regional Water Quality Control Board was concerned about the amount of rock we're putting in the channel. So we've had to go back and optimize the design by evaluating different flow regimes, five year, 10 year, 25 year, 50 year, to see where the velocities uh, would, would uh, increase to a point where it would cause erosion and then justify the rock in, in that manner. Um, and then, like I said, there's a wee two foot thick of native soil at the invert uh, to promote habitat value. And then uh, the upper slopes um, of the channel will be tr treated with uh, seed mix and natural erosion control blankets. Next slide, please. So the most difficult portion of this project, in my opinion, is the replacement of the existing bridges at the East Channel along Caribbean Drive. And it's going to be, the two bridges are going to be replaced with a triple cell box culvert, which you see the cross section in the bottom right corner of this slide. So we're going to replace it with the larger uh, triple cell culvert. And then it requires a stage detour, traffic control detour plan. And the West Channel, we have two places where we're building uh, under crossing culverts. And that would be at Carl Road Bridge next to the treatment plant. We're replacing that existing um, single cell uh, culvert with a larger uh, culvert. And then in uh, Java Drive, we have uh, the existing conditions there are, there's sidewalk, there's no sidewalk at the street, but there's two, you know, on each side, there's a pedestrian kind of sidewalk bridge that 
goes over the levy. Well, we're going to replace that at the direction of the city to um, extend the culvert underneath Java and put in new sidewalks there and eliminate those bridges. And then lastly, like again, for the, uh, for the second time here, the, the project does provide 100 year flood protection. Next slide, please. So there's been various uh, agreements associated with this project. So first, like I said earlier, there's been a, uh, already executed in 2016, a joint use agreement for trails and, and also a cost share agreement for that. And you can see in yellow uh, is the trail uh, location or limits of the trails. And it, pretty easy to remember on the east side of the east channel will be the, the, the city trail. On the west side of the west channel will be the city trail. Um, and then the, the, the red at the very top is the cost sharing agreement that the district has executed with um, Google for uh, resurfacing of the uh, Bay Trail. And then I do want to point out one other portion in this slide. As you see the little highlighted on the West Channel in the kind of upper middle uh, portion of the uh, slide up by the red, it says Google West Channel Project. That's 1,100 linear feet. And like I said, we submitted our permit applications in June of 2017. Shortly thereafter, Google came to the district um, to partner on an enhancement project. And it was, it was timely because the district was looking for on-site mitigation to offset impacts to this project. And so we've been working together since 2017. I think it's taken a little longer with all the parties involved, including the city of Sunnyvale who prepared the document was the, the CEQA lead for the Google project. So there's been a lot of players involved and it's taken a long time, but we're getting near the end of that and we're hoping that uh, the district could finalize an agreement um, with Google in the next couple months. Next slide, please. So the other thing that uh, Mr. Taylor talked about, the shared perimeter wall, the, the joint project between the city and Valley Water. Um, you can see in red, that's the location where we're doing the joint wall. Um, as Mr. Taylor explained, that construction is currently estimated in 2023. Um, the alignment, in my understanding, is still kind of being um, uh, determined because of the existing north or the wall proposed at the north side of the plant is underneath some PG&E lines. So I think there's some design constraints that uh, the city is working with PG&E on uh, to finalize that alignment. And then we have a pending uh, cost sharing agreement for the wall that's gone through legal counsel a couple times. So I think we're close on that. And I think um, you know, we're on target to, uh, to get that executed um, to meet this construction schedule. Next slide, please. So just as a summary, just kind of where we're at. So the design is, is complete. We're uh, working, we're talking to the city on a regular basis. And once the uh, final or 100% design plans are, we're planning on to submit them to the city. Uh, we have been submitting plans myself. I've been to the city many times over the years, um, providing updates and also uh, various versions of the construction uh, drawings for their review. So we're working on, like I said, the final agreement with Google, hopefully in the next couple months. And then we also are doing an EIR addendum because this Google modification requires us to do an addendum to our EIR. And then our permit discussions are ongoing. The hope is that we would get our uh, resource agency permits in 2022, and then construction would be advertised upon receipt of the permits. And, and just to kind of explain why finalizing the agreement with Google is so important is because um, once we can finalize that agreement and we know what the mitigation, that the excess mitigation that will be created uh, by the Google project that could be used by Valley Water to offset our impacts, but then we can kind of conclude our uh, analysis with the resource agencies on where the on-site mitigation will be and whether we need additional mitigation either on-site or, or off-site. Uh, next slide, please. And that concludes my brief update. Any questions by anybody? I'll turn it back over to Rochelle. Thank you, Rochelle. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, any public comment? Yes, Mr. Chair, I have a Miss Eileen McLaughlin. Yes. Hi, Ms. McLaughlin. Good evening. Good evening, Chair Estamara, and good evening to members of uh, council and of the board of directors. Um, I want
wanted to follow up on some of the questions that you know, the, you know that Stephen was uh, describing uh, and talking about the creek and the ecological damage that I'm afraid is inevitable in in performing this project and uh, in, in the structures that you're planning on putting in the creek. Um, I am concerned there's a you know long distance of brackish habitat going up quite a ways and then you get down right uh, near the bay and you have actual tidal habitat and these are actually serving real uh, you know excellent habitat functions today. Um, what are your mitigations that you're going to be doing to uh, replace them? I, I'm quite concerned about you know how we can maintain the use of the channel uh, and that function of the channel and from an environmental perspective uh, and and with the least disruption over time that's possible. Uh, the the overall width of the East Channel is. Uh, it is, is such that it's barren at the top, and here we're losing major, major green vegetation and habitat down the channel. So if I could, you know, there could be a response, you know, that discusses that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McLaughlin. Chair Escamara, I can respond yes. to that if you'd like. Yes, yes, Stephen, go ahead. Okay, uh, Thank you. Mr. Goffman, uh, great questions. We, we share the same concerns. So that's why I pointed out the, the crossing on the slide at um, the East Channel at uh, Caribbean. That is the only place that we're doing any work within the channel along the East, the East Channel. So we have impacts there, but there's an existing bridge structure there that uh, vegetation under that bridge doesn't grow. But you know, we're, we've minimized our impacts of in-channel work. I also mentioned on the West Channel, we're doing the work at Carl Road. So that's just a culvert there. We're not doing um, uh, any work along the West Channel all the way up until we get to um, upstream of 101. Um, and then there is the Google enhancement. So most of our work is confined uh, to, the, to the top of banks and increasing the levee, resurfacing and installing flood walls. On the East Channel, where I showed the typical section for the rock, um, that is mainly upstream, away from um, tidal influence, uh, upstream of 101. And the reason for that is, oh, I mentioned where the PG&E towers are, we're gonna be using those rocks to stabilize those banks because that erosion ends up in the bay anyway. So it, it's better that we keep that, um, that material from eroding and, and just you know adding, adding sediment to the bay. So those are the only areas where we're adding rock soil protection. So I didn't want to mislead you that, you know, we're, we're rocking nine miles of channel. We're not doing that. It's very isolated and it's, it is isolated to just those locations where we have existing erosion or, and where the hydraulic model proves that we have velocities that require us to, to rock the slopes. Hope that answers your question. Thanks, Stephen. Anybody else? Yes, I have Miss Gita Dev. Yes, hi, Miss Dev. Uh, thank you again for letting us um, speak here. Sure. I do have a couple of questions. Yes. First of all, thank you for the explanation, Stephen, about the rock. Uh, I had this similar concern when I saw that, but I understand better now. Um, my questions are more general. One is, one would hope that when you did this flood control, you would be looking at improving the ecology. Uh, this is an eco-innovation district, and we were hoping to see something where we would see it being made more of a riparian corridor. Uh, that has been the conversation in all the community meetings, and we're, I'm very dismayed to hear that there is absolutely no real consideration about making it an improvement. So I would like very much to hear your thoughts about that as the Moffat Park area being um, an ecology area and counting on this waterways as part of that ecology for, um, for creatures, for birds, for insects, and so forth. That was one area I would love to hear more. And the other was um, when I looked at the box culverts that you proposed, the first thing that occurred to me 
when I went out there and looked at it after a one of the high tides, is that the water is always almost at the level of the road already. And while the box culverts may increase the capacity, what about the actual level of the water? I mean, would the road actually have to be raised um, and the box culverts put at a higher elevation than they are now at the top of the box culverts? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Any response? Chair Mayor, yes, you would like yes, to Steve. respond? Yes, please. Thank you, Steve. Okay, uh, very good question on that. You know, I, I do think we've looked at the channel from a flood protection project to try to increase um, beneficial uses and, and ecological and biological uh, enhancements. We, we've been working with this, like I said, on a, a, a Google project. That was for a widening channel concept where Google and Valley Water are jointly going to be uh, installing in-stream native plants. Uh, to try to enhance uh, the creek in that section. Um, you know, one of the questions has been, why don't we do that all other locations? And it's such a confined real, est real estate to, from a real estate standpoint, we cannot widen the channel because we'd be going into private property and the private property has large office building complexes that are developed. So we're very limited on a right away uh, basis uh, to expand the channel and try to uh, create um, a riparian corridor. It's very. It's also very difficult to create a riparian corridor because this is not a natural watershed. It doesn't have an upstream uh, watershed that that promotes the riparian vegetation to be sustained through, you know, normal um, normal seasonal flow. Uh, the flow for Sunnyvale East and West is generated by storm drains. It's what drains off the streets and into the channel. Um, but we are looking at different different alternatives to uh, provide, you know, slope blanketing and a different uh, different uh, native plant locations to to enhance the channel. So, um, like I said, and we've and we've been working the last few years with Google on this project. The um, the other question, I you can oh, what was the you can remind me the other portion of your question. Um, thanks, Stephen. Sorry. It's really that, particularly at Caribbean and even down oh, yes. upstream from Caribbean okay. towards the bay. Yeah, so, so will we have to raise the, the street level at Car Caribbean? It's already raised. If you know it goes over the East Channel, you can see there's a hump in the road. And we're not making that hump any worse. And, and, and it's kind of hard to figure, it, to visualize, but we're such at the bay that the channel hydraulics are controlled really by the bay. And, you know, it's kind of like a backwater effect. And all it is is a big, big lake floating to another big lake, the, the San Francisco Bay. So the width of the channel, um, you know, it, it has very little to do with the hydraulics. Um, and, and just to tell you, the box culvert was designed with the cells full, half full of sediment because um, as you see underneath, there's a lot of bay muds that are that are captured, you know, under the bridges, and the channel gets full. Well, you're not even if you went in there and dredged it out after a few rain events or tidal back and forth, those 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 deposits are going to come right back. So you have to model it with that with that sediment in there. So to answer your question, yes, the the, the bay uh, there's not a lot of um, freeboard per se with the existing structure. There won't be for the new structure. And that's why we're built we have to build flood walls at those at the downstream locations at Caribbean. Is that kind of that's maybe a difficult concept to, to understand about the, the bay and how it how it's so controlling of the hydraulics. Okay. Uh, any, any other, other questions? I have no other, uh, Mr. Chair, I have no other public comment. I do have four council members that have their hands raised. Okay. Uh, any uh, questions or comments from um, board members or council members? Yes, I have four council members. So yes. I'll start with council member Din. Thank you. Uh, and apologies again that I, my camera is off just dealing with my internet. <laughs> um, but thank you for the fantastic presentation. I think my, my first question is, when it comes to the cost sharing agreement with Google, is that fully signed? And at a high level, can you just give me some ballpark breakdowns of how the costs are being split 
just from percentages, not even net values. So this is regarding the Google Trail, yep. the pay trail portion? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, that, that, the, the uh, Google was going to um, like resurface that with uh, decomposed granite. And, um, you know, that's, we're going to, we're going to end up using that to construct the project for access. So um, Google was, you know, understood that, hey, we may go out there and kind of clean it up a little bit, but we don't want to do the final thing because we just turn around and tear it up and then have to replace it um, again. So that was the agreement there. I, it's, it's, you know, uh, I, okay. it's, it's just because, you know, it's like the whole, the whole, you know, the whole uh, public thing where somebody uh, uh, paves a new street and the next day they're out there digging, uh, trenching it. So we're trying to get ahead of that where we do our work and, and, and do some damage to the trail and then we come back in and fix it one, one time and not have, you know, the public concern that we're redoing and spending public dollars twice. Ah, uh, okay. Now that explains it well. So thank you for that. Um, and then my other question is more of just like a basic general high level one as well. When it comes to where the channels are meeting the bay, is there any thinking about or is there any potential impact of sea level rise and climate change on that? Is that going to affect, uh, you know, water going back in or where the water actually is meeting it? Um, and yeah, I think that's basically the question, just high level on how that looks, that interplay looks. Okay, both the Sunnydale East and West uh, hydraulics are based on two two feet of sea level rise. Ah, uh, okay, so, perfect. So it was incorporated question. in the design. Ah, uh, okay, thank you. Those are all my questions. And uh, Council Member Dean, I want to apologize for mispronouncing your name. Um, Mr. Chair, I have a uh, mayor. <laughs> You're totally fine. Mayor, There's no worries. <laughs> mayor Klein has his hand raised. Yes, Mayor Klein. Sure. Um, several questions. Um, one of which is you talked about the agreement with Google and and as kind of a next step in a series of things to get to an actual construction bid uh, and then the EIR update and all that. So what what is kind of the holdup for that? And you know, is there anything is that that we can do to to get that approval moving forward? Because you know, I look at that construction bid and you currently listed as sometime in 2022 but it's after uh the resource agency permitting uh before you can actually put that out to bid you know when we were here almost three years ago we were guessing that that the construction bid was going out in 2019 so what you know what are it looks like it's a waterfall of first google then agency and then the bid is that correct or is there or am I missing something? You're pretty close. It's uh, it was agency. We submitted the permits in June of 2017, and then shortly thereafter, uh, the resource agencies uh, wanted more information on our permits, and they they one of their comments on the permits was on the permit applications was they wanted to see more on-site mitigation and setback um, floodplain concept. And about two months later, Google came to us with that exact concept. And like I said, we can't do that in other places because we don't have the right of way. The only reason that this works is because Google is dedicating a bunch of property on both sides of the, of the West Channel to facilitate this kind of uh, enhancement project. So then it got to the, you know, the Google project had to be, uh, had to have CEQA completed. And the city took the lead on that. In the meantime, we didn't stop what we were doing. We, we still, you know, uh, were, were acquiring right away and, and finishing the design and working with the your treatment plant folks on the shared wall. And, and it, was, it was, so it was still going on. It's just that now that we need the Google to answer your question, why that's a priority, the Google agreement is because it, it is going to create on-site mitigation. And that on-site mitigation is gonna be used by Google to offset their impacts, as well as the excess to be used for the district flood protection project to offset our comment, to offset our impacts and to address comments from the resource agencies. We originally in our permit applications offered to go offsite mitigation because of the, of the lack of, of, of right of way to do in stream and, and do uh, in channel uh, mitigation. It's just not a lot of room. So to address that comment of doing on site mitigation, here was Google that said, we're going to widen the channel and do on site mitigation, and have excess mitigation for it. So 
And, and we just got through that process of getting those numbers done. And now we actually have finite numbers of what, what those on-site mitigation will be versus what, what mitigation we do need for the, the project impacts. So you needed to have that, those numbers, those mitigation numbers to be able to get to the end with the resource agencies as far as, okay, here's your impacts. Here's what's gonna be supplied by Google's project. Here's where the other mitigation is coming from. So you have a balance. Here's our permits. Okay, and so, you know, if there's anything that we can do or I can do to expedite that agreement, you know, ultimately it is this waterfall of, of items, whether or not it's, it's other agencies, it's the, the agreement with Google, you know, we all want to kind of move this forward, especially as this, this the mitigation, once it's implemented, mitigating the long-term risk as far as flooding and all that, for which is beneficial for everyone at the end of the day. So, you know, definitely um, I, I'm hoping that, that things have now been cleared away and we can basically close off these last punch items as quickly as possible and see and see the bid, you know, per early in 2022, as opposed to the end of 2022 from that standpoint. Oh, I, I, I appreciate the city's support on this, you know, the whole process with the, with Google and the development and, and being the lead with CEQA. And nobody, nobody wants this project constructed more than I do. I can trust you, trust <laughs> me on that. And I appreciate that. Uh, one thing that I had a question on is, is monitoring. So, what monitoring is ultimately being put in place uh, as far as potential flood monitoring during, you know, let's say king tides or, or other kind of the tide con tidal conditions that could conceivably lead to flooding? So what we typically do, not just on Sunday, at least in West, but all our channels in, in, in the county, um, after a, a, a significant event, we go out there and actually take survey of the high water marks. And then compare the the, uh, the flow data with what what the queue was in the channel or the flow you know the flow regime, and see compare it to our model and see if our model is accurately uh, assessing what the water surface elevation will, you know is. So we have a theoretical water surface elevation for a certain amount of water, and we, we basically verify that after after significant storm events. So you know, to, then we may have to adjust the adjust the model or, or do do other some maybe do more maintenance in certain areas, less maintenance in others. So there's a constant uh, like verification process that that uh, Valley Water does. Thank you, and that's that's kind of post a storm event. What what monitoring is done? Is there is there or is there monitoring done during during a storm event? Oh yeah, we have. Is a, there, what's what's the what's the mechanism for? for well, we have a we have a flood information team that actually flood team that goes out and uh, basically are on call when there's a significant event coming where we think there's going to be uh, potential for flooding, and we know you know it's it's no mystery where the hot spots are in the whole county. We you know we know where it's going to flood first on on every channel. So, you know, we position people in those locations. We, you know, in the lower the South County, we'll actually have equipment on site where those sites are and, and we'll, and other places in the county, we'll have people there, whatever's needed to assist with that flooding that we, we know can occur at that location. For instance, sandbags or, you know, um, different type of uh, pumping equipment. Uh, where South County, we have more uh, rural, where we have uh, more equipment that, that could be available to help with with uh, flooding. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for your answers. Thank you. Council Member Larson. Yes. Council Member Larson. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, and uh, thank you to staff for the answer to the mayor's first question because that was something I also wanted to, to ask about. Um, the permitting of both the, uh, the Google enhancement mm -hmm. and then also the, the wall along our water pollution control plant um, those are very important to Sunnyvale. Um, and so whatever we can do to um, get the permitting completed expeditiously is important uh, for us. Um, I did want to ask um, about the, the Google enhancement because as we are working on our Moffat Park um, specific plan, which is the next item on the agenda tonight, um, it would be good to see uh, if the Google enhancement could become a model 
for what we can do elsewhere along the east and west channel. Um, and I, I realized that that you don't, uh, the Valley Water doesn't have the land to do that. Um, but as the, uh, the land use permitting agency, the, the city does have some levers that we can pull to um, uh, encourage developers as they redevelop properties to actually do more things like the Google enhancement. And it, it would be great to see that as much as possible along the East and West channel. And so my question is what, um, what can we do as a city to um, to preserve that opportunity to work with Valley Water to to make sure that our plans and our schedules line up um, so that we can continue to work towards that goal? Okay, so I, I think we're uh, the, the perimeter wall, shared perimeter wall. It's a good example. We've been talking about that for maybe two two and a half years. Uh, we've been uh, meeting about the design with the design consultant. And we've gone had some good back and forth. I think we're ahead of the curve on that. Um, so I, I think there's been a good collaboration by by both parties on 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 getting that to the to the finish line. As far as um, doing the enhancements along the uh, east and west channel, I I think Valley Water and our and our boards always show that they're willing uh, willingness to to explore those opportunities, especially if it's going to enhance the environment. Um, it's it, at this, you know, we're kind of chasing our tail because this project's been on the books for so long. We want to get it built. But just because it's built doesn't mean it can't be, portions of it can't be altered after construction or even during construction. If it's not, if it's, for instance, if we're in construction and we haven't done some portion of the East Channel upstream uh, and there's an opportunity to do that, we can always, you know, eliminate that portion of the work and do some mod kind of modified design at that via a change order or a, a redesign in that section. So um, that's something we can do during construction and that's in, and then in post construction, we can always modify the, the, the project after it's constructed. Good, that, that, that's very good to hear because I, I think um, that collaboration between the city and Valley Water is gonna be very important in um, enhancing as much of those channels as possible in, in the Moffat Park area. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Cisneros. Uh, Council Member Cisneros. Yeah, thank you very much. And wonderful presentation, very informative. And I wanted to first say that the members of the public really took my first question. Um, I'm very concerned about environmental impacts, especially in this region, but it was really nice to hear um, from you all that it, it is also a major concern and it's been very well thought through. So thank you very much for that. And my other question was, uh, what is the life cycle and maintenance look like for uh, these walls and flood protection measures that we have? And is Google going to share in any costs associated with maintenance or, or replacing as necessary? Yeah, so there's a, there's a couple parts there. Overall, we have a, a stream maintenance program that uh, we utilize for all our all our channels and we uh, negotiate 10-year uh, stream maintenance permits uh, every 10 years and so we would do uh, routine maintenance and that would be uh, sediment control or sediment removal and vegetation control so um, if, if there's if there's uh, sediment that's in this in this channel we really like i said because of much of the east and west channel are tidal influence it doesn't make a lot of sense to remove bay muds because after a few tidal cycles it's right back um, so there's going to be very little sediment removal uh, on the downstream portions of either either channel i would say very little or none it's more upstream of 101 where you're outside of tidal influence where uh, sediment removal um, is occurs now just because of the erosion sites that i showed you on the east channel because of the the various uh, lining around the pg and &E towers that throws the water back into banks and causes erosion. Like I said, with the with the isolated rock slope protection we're putting on those areas, we're hoping that that minimizes uh, maintenance and long term maintenance because it's it's not you know nobody wants to have to spend the money, you know, uh, yearly uh, doing maintenance if we can avoid it. So um, that's what we're trying to do. 
but that's our program for, for maintenance. And as far as the Google project, um, the previous uh, council members mentioned the fact that, you know, what, what we need to get this going and we need to do this and, and we all agree that, uh, but that agreement not only covers cost, but it covers the maintenance and you hit on that. So figuring out who's gonna be maintaining what and where um, is a component of that agreement. It's not something that's, that's stopping it. It's just something that needs to be, uh, you know, worked out and coordinated and, and finalized. And that's been going on for some time and we're very close. On it. So, Glad to hear it. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you. We have council member Melton. Council member Melton. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I don't I don't have any questions. I just wanted to make a comment that um, I feel immense gratitude to Valley Water for your amazing partnership on these critical pieces of infrastructure in Sunnyvale. I mean, the original purpose was flood control. Uh, and now um, we're accomplishing through Valley Water's leadership a revitalization of both of these very important channels. Um, and one of the things that will be accomplished, our, our, our Valley Water project leader mentioned it, and I'll, I'll remember this, is the public use trails. And it's gonna be the west side of the west channel <laughs> and the east side of the east channel. Um, and that has a tremendous benefit in Sunnyvale in terms of connectivity and accomplishing um, some very important policy objectives in Sunnyvale about active transportation uses and getting uh, a network built of people uh, who are able to walk or uh, use active transportation uses to get to their destinations. And so, um, yes, more, faster. Thank you, Valley Water, for everything you're doing on this really complicated project. And thank you very much. I have uh, Ms. Sue Tippetts that would like to speak. Yes, Ms. Tippetts. Uh, Sue? Thank you, Chair Astamira. Um, yes, um, it's a discussion about Google and trails. I just wanted to uh, mention while we're all here that uh, as a part of the, um, the Google project in Sunnyvale East and the trail project that we all are working together on, there is a component of that that will be coming back to the city council and that will be um, an um, amendment or a um, redoing of the joint use agreement. And this um, evolved the, through the work with Google and where the trail is located and what improvements that they are proposing on um, the Valley Water right of way. So um, the gist of it will be the same, but there'll be some uh, just adjustments in the language. So I just want to let you know that that will be coming your way. Thank you. We have no other hands raised at this time. Okay, uh, and thank you for the discussion. I just quickly mentioned you know that once completed, the um, this project is going to protect 1,618 homes, uh, 47 acres of highly valuable industrial and government lands from a 100-year flood. Um, this flood protection uh, project uh, could save Sunnyvale from over 44 million dollars in flood damages from a serious flood event, which we know happens. Uh, and lastly, the sediment control measures within the project will also improve water quality in Sunnyvale Creeks, just to mention a few things. Uh, no motion is required for this uh, for this report. So we'll go right along to the next uh, agenda item um, and uh, we'll turn it over to uh, our Mayor Klein. Thank you, Chair Estromera. Uh, our next item is an update on the Moffat Park specific plan, working very closely with the last item. Uh, city Manager, can you introduce the staff who will be reporting on this? Yes, thank you, Mayor. And the Moffitt, Moffitt Park specific plan is one of the largest land use plans the city's undertaken in many years. Um, Moffitt Park is all that uh, area in Sunnyvale, north of Highway 237, so it's a very large area. Um, there's a, a lot of tremendous possibilities for us to see redevelopment in this area. And so we're working through a land use planning process um, there. And first I wanna just say thank you for district staff who have been involved in our stakeholder group meeting. So we've been meeting on this for a couple of years and uh, district staff have been participating. So I really appreciate that. Um, with that, I'd like to turn it over to the other Michelle King. Um, our Michelle King is a principal planner in our community development department and she'll be presenting an overview of the Moffat Park specific plan process. 
Thank you, city manager. And someday all the Michelle Kings will have to meet. <laughs> um, so I'll let uh, the presentation load here. So um, again, um, my name is Michelle King, the principal planner of the city of Sunnyvale, um, leading the effort for the Moffat Park specific plan update. Um, please, uh, next slide. As discussed, the Moffat Park specific plan area is a very large area at the north end of the city of Sunnyvale, about 1,270 acres. Um, it is bounded at the south by Highway 237 and at the north by um, the Moffat Federal Airfield directly to the west. The um, city facilities, including the wastewater treatment plant, the closed landfill, the smart center, um, and they uh, several recreational facilities, including Baylands Park, the private, private ball field, and um, is that North Caribbean Drive at the very north edge, and Bay, as I mentioned, Bay Park Parklands to the east. Next slide. So the city council has been working on um, with staff, staff and others on the. Um, development of, a, of an update to the Moffat Park specific plan. And one of the critical aspects of this update is the vision um, in which the Moffat Park area is an integral part of the city and is well connected eco innovation district with a diverse mix of uses that serve as a model of resilience, climate protection, equity and economic opportunity. The Moffat Park area is critically located next to the um, bay and is the area of the city of Sunnyvale that is most subject to sea level rise. It is also home to many um, office um, employers, including major employers such as Google. Next slide. So some of the other guiding principles um, to the plan area are to look for opportunities and, and policies that will um, strive for resilience and um, equality in the equity in the plan area. So the plan area be vibrant and inclusive, um, have a diverse economy and prosperity, um, be accessible um, and pedestrian friendly and uh, connect to the city's efforts ongoing for the active transportation plan have dynamic and connected public spaces, including um, open space that is both ecologically focused and recreationally focused, have a healthy and biodiverse environment, which is a big um, change to the existing in built infrastructure in Moffat Park, which is primarily asphalt um, and was built as an industrial park in the past. So this is a big change and continue Moffat Park in its leading um, the Silicon Valley in innovation and in emerging technology. Next slide. So what is a specific plan? Um, a specific plan is a comprehensive planning um, tool for um, an area that is smaller than the city. It establishes a vision and guiding, guiding principles for that particular area, defines policy and development standards, and has a strong focus on implementation um, because a specific plan changes the land use of the plan area. Most likely that's followed by needed changes in infrastructure, which is why implementation is so important. Next slide. Um, some of the requirements for specific plans are looking at the distribution and location and extent of the uses of land, including open space, um, the extent of the intensity of marriage components in transportation and infrastructure. And again, in the plan area, we have the advent advantageous um, existing uh, light rail system and, uh, and a bus system, as well as private transportation and uh, uh, ongoing effort in putting in Green Link, F uh, in, sorry, Green Link and active transportation improvements. Um, the specific plan needs a program of implementation measures and um, has a statement of relationship of the plan to the general plan, which is the state's guiding document. Next slide. So I won't go through all of these, um, but we got some um, direction from both the Planning Commission and the City Council to come up with an, a comprehensive engagement strategy look at the potential economic impacts of adding housing to the plan area. The plan area has been, has been uh, only office and industrial uses up until this point. 
So this is a change in the mix of land uses in the plan area. Uh, also, there's retail in the plan area. So this would be an increase in retail and the addition of housing. Um, redefine the Moffat Park area as an ecological and innovation district, um, capitalizing on the ecological potential for the plan area and the existing innovation. Um, continue looking at improvements in both um, in all of modes of mobility, including pedestrian, bicycle, and transit connectivity. Looking at changing the way that urban um, design standards function on Moffat Park to improve mobility opportunities. Uh, having an implementation strategy for a long-term look at needed infrastructure, and of course, um, complying with CEQA and looking at the environmental impacts of the, of the project. Next slide. So there have been um, quite a few meetings uh, with Moffat Park over the last two years, many meetings, but this is a short recap of the meetings we've had in the last um, 12 months, including having um, very comprehensive public workshops on sea level rise and climate change, um, specifically in the plan area, um, the potential um, solutions for transportation and infrastructure in Moffa Park, including mobility, sea level rise um, infrastructure, as well as um, future sewer and water needs, and the potential changes to the land use, housing and open space plan for the plan area and what the market and economic ramifications of those changes might be. Um, in May of 2021, the city council gave direction to the staff on a new land use concept for the plan area to be studied. And in August of 2021, um, the notice of preparation for the EIR was released and we received comments. Next slide. So this is the um, land use direction we received from city council. And you can see that um, the previous land use plan was all office um, with some industrial in the purple and office being blue. Well, now we have an additional um, land use designations that are um, uh, residential in the yellow and a mixed use designation in the orange and in the um, designation that is hatched, that's an a area that could be either residential or office. Um, there's a little bit of institutional use on this map that's existing, which is kind of a dark purple, but this new land use direction would allow for 20,000 new housing units um, and 10 million um, square feet of new office, um, net new office development. Um, next slide. So this goes over this land use program in a little more detail. Um, the land use program is, the land use map is primarily looking at what those new uses will be, but um, critical aspects of how this new plan um, will function are looking at how open space and urban ecology will serve this new part of the city that will be a vibrant neighborhood that will have residential office and open spaces in it. So part of our plan will be is an ongoing study of open space and urban ecology for the plan area, including at, um, adding parks and plazas and other open spaces and connected network of eco patches, including um, eco corridors and linear parks that could be created by setbacks from the existing east and west channel, as well as other um, standalone ecological features. Slide. Um, of course, adding housing to the plan area will also require looking at community facilities and services, including public schools and public safety, as well as looking at ways to um, uh, enhance and improve the network of streets and paths and connections in the plan area, including looking at ways to cross the existing channels, um, specifically and importantly for um, transit, bikes, and, and pets. Next slide. So the plan requires um, an environmental impact report, and we are doing a comprehensive review of all of these topics, um, including, um, importantly, hydrology and water quality. Um, we'll be doing um, studies of geology and soils, and, and um, a water supply assessment. Next slide. 
We've had um, several really productive meetings in, in technical working groups um, in our technical, with our technical working group. We've also had many one-on-one -on -one meetings in, in, with all of our partners in this process, including Valley Water. We've been very productive. And we've also participated in the shoreline visioning process with Valley Water. So we feel like we've made a lot of strides in seeing how Moffa Park can connect to the goals of Valley Water as well as the city of Honeyville. Next slide. So we have a really um, a comprehensive website that has not only the project updates, but all of the materials from every um, public event we've held so far, as well as all the technical studies and informative videos. I also wanted to make sure, because I, I think I skipped it in the land use discussion, that to be clear that this is a very long range plan. This is a 20 to 30 year plan. So the level of growth that's anticipated is not gonna occur um, as soon as the plan is adopted. It has a long rollout and it also serves to um, meet the city's affordable housing and overall housing goals that the state requires that the city and the city wants to meet for the citizens. So this is a plan that has many purposes, um, one of which is providing future housing opportunities. And that concludes my presentation. Oh, sorry, does not, I lied. So <laughs> I think I'm out of time though. So here's the uh, planning process overview. Um, talked a little bit about those um, events that we've had in 2021 already. And we're in the process of um, analyzing and producing the technical studies that are needed for the plan and the EIR. We are hoping to come back to city council and to the public in a series of study sessions towards the end of this year and early of next year that will focus on open space and urban ecology and opportunities to enhance um, those features in the plan area as well as mobility um, and transportation with a third topic of being um, land use. At the same time, we are developing the policies of the plan, which will be part of those discussions as well as the body of the document um, and drafting the EIR. And we're hoping to come back for plan adoption to decision makers in um, the summer and fall of 2022. Next slide. Ah, one more. So um, next steps are um, the study sessions that I mentioned, further collaboration with the technical working group members, stakeholders and advocates. So we have really, um, again, gotten a lot out of our conversations with Valley Water on many topics and we, we um, We'll be coming back to them with some of the results of our policies around urban ecology that I think dovetail nicely with some of the goals of the Valley Water. And I think there's a lot of crossover. Um, we continue with online engagement. Um, there will be more um, opportunities for people to engage in the materials for the plan online as we go through the study session materials. And again, we're drafting the specific plan and the EIR over the next six months or so. Um, and we plan to have a series of public hearings before the planning commission and city council, hoping to finish in fall of 2022. And I think that concludes it for real. There you go. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. Uh, we will now go to public comment. I'll open the public hearing. Since we remain in a virtual setting, I'll ask the public to use the virtual raised hand button or dial star nine on your telephone to indicate that you wish to speak. The clerk will then ask you to unmute your microphone and it's your turn to address the council and the district board. Speakers will be given three minutes to speak. Uh, board clerk, do we have any members of the public wishing to speak on this item? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. As of right now, I have three. The first is Ms. Julian Peddleton. Hello, uh, my name is Juliana Pendleton and I'm the Environmental Advocacy Assistant for the Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society. We have participated in the Moffitt Park specific plan process, provi providing public comments, attending meetings, and providing scoping comments on the notice of preparation for the EIR. The plan to transform Moffitt Park into an eco district is exciting to us if it truly reflects the ecology of the area, enhances habitat, and protects wildlife. Our mission as an organization is to promote the enjoyment, understanding, and protection of birds and other wildlife by engaging people of all ages 
in birding, education, and conservation. We support the guiding principle and Sunnyvale's goal of a healthy and biodiverse environment. In the context of the plan, we advocated for the protection and expansion of wetlands and natural areas and for natural buffers along waterways. Valley water collaboration will be criti critical and is currently critical to the success of the Moffitt Park specific plan. And we hope Sunnyvale, <coughs> Valley Water and the landowners will be transparent and engage the community deeply in designing the future of Moffitt Park. We had some positive discussions with Lockheed and Google, uh, but some questions still remain, especially pertaining to the water waterways and wetlands that go through or adjacent to the planned area, questions about stormwater management in the face of sea level rise, and questions about impacts of increased recreational activity on levees having negative impacts on migratory birds. Last week, walking along the East Channel, I had the uh, great pleasure of seeing a red-tailed hawk and a beautiful green heron. Um, I hope to see many more of these in the future and maybe even a burrowing owl. Thank you for your time. Thank you. The next member of the public is Miss Jennifer Chang Hederly. Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. My name is Jennifer Chang Hederly. I'm the Sierra Club's Bay Alive Campaign Coordinator. The Loma Prieta chapter has been closely following, following and participating in the Moffat Park specific plan update process. And we continue to hope that the city will lean into the ecology part of its eco innovation vision for the district. To us, that means protecting the biodiversity and sustainability of wetlands and open space, both within and adjacent to the plan area, optimizing for natural and nature-based sea level rise resilience, and maximizing urban canopy, habitat-rich open space, and low-impact recreation opportunities throughout the area. We are anxiously awaiting specifics about the, how the Moffat Park specific plan will address those issues. I wanna quickly thank Google for taking a number of environmental groups to tour the flood channels and other site features. We appreciate their efforts to explore viable alternatives to flood walls on parts of the West Channel and their work with the city and the water district to figure out how to make them happen. And I'm, I'm excited to hear council members interested in exploring other opportunities along the channels to, to follow that model. Um, we also appreciate their willingness to envision and invest in multi-benefit open spaces that go well beyond corporate landscaping to serve community needs. So we'd really like to see the city engage all the major property owners and developers in Moffat Park to be partners in similar solutions, as well as in funding for future shoreline protection projects. We're also concerned about water supply. Your discussions tonight painted a pretty dire picture. So we look forward to hearing how that plays out vis-a-vis -vis the Moffat Park specific plan. We understand that the Santa Clara Valley Water Commission has raised concerns that limited water supplies could impede the feasibility of regional housing requirements in the coming cycle. And the housing being studied for this specific plan far exceeds Sunnyvale's RENA numbers. So it's critically important to understand where the water will come from and to support this project. We hope to see a thorough and realistic water supply assessment in the EIR that identifies all water sources and reflects increasingly severe climate change impacts on drought and pre precipitation patterns that looks at system supply and infrastructure constraints and considers the cumulative demand, including from modern commercial uses and from other large master planning efforts in Sunnyvale. We are really pleased to see this joint session on the calendar and I uh, look forward to your discussion. Thank you again for the chance to comment. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, uh, the last member of the, oh, sir, I have two more. Um, the first one is Ms. Eileen McLaughlin. Uh, good evening again, um, council members and members of the board. Um, I wanted to come back and, and catch up on some comments and things that we've talked about here tonight because a lot of these different items kind of flow into one another. And, um, and so I wanted to uh, go back to, um, I think, when Stephen Fronte was describing and discussing to, uh, to Gita's question about what was or wasn't possible in the East Channel. And uh, I would 
like to ask the, you know, that there be a bigger picture view here. I'm a huge fan of the Calabasas Creek and San Tomas Aquino Creek project in the Water District. And it has enormous challenges, but it has enormous future type goals with a new, vi new vision. And that's what we have here. I was glad to hear Councilmember Larson ask about what we could do to work on uh, the, the channels, particularly the East Channel, to change its, uh, you know, what it is now into something much more ecologically uh, valuable and inviting. And, uh, you know, I know with great respect to Steve Perante, he said it could not be riparian, but if you visit the a flood basin, which known as the Charleston Basin and north of Bayshore. Um, it's a beautiful riparian-like area. And so let's see what's possible. And I'm hoping that there is some way that um, the city, the water district, and Google, for it, it might be a combination, could work together and come up with a new, new vision of what could sprout in that channel uh, and, and serve uh, the purposes of the Moffat Park specific plan as, as uh, Sunnydale, as Michelle King said, uh, the, the plan is to try to maybe try to get some setback from the creek and, and make it more of a, an ecological area for everyone to enjoy. So um, I'm hoping that that idea can, can, can sprout from a seed here tonight and be a, a future uh, project that we can all look forward to. Thank you. Thank you. And the last member of the public I have um, is Miss Geta Dev. Thank you again for the opportunity to comment here. Um, I, w I want to um, emphasize how important we feel that some of uh, the comments that were just made by Jennifer Heavily and also by Ali McLaughlin are for the Moffat Park and for Valley Water. Uh, I understood very clearly, Stephen, and Rochelle had mentioned this earlier, that the problem of real estate and the easement that you're given is very restrictive and it's private property. Um, however, once again, with the strong emphasis that we're putting on an eco-innovation district that the whole community is looking to this area. Um, any, uh, any possibilities for making, expanding the channel to be more riparian, maybe in the future, where those could be mitigations as well. That could be an encouragement and inducement and an uh, incentive to open up the channel for uh, mitigation possibilities. Uh, I do want to mention that this whole area is much lower than the water in the channels. And therefore, one of our main concerns, um, which we've articulated uh, to Michelle and others, is that the open spaces have not been um, recognized in the, in the land use plan. And the open spaces in our case here in Moffat Park are going to have to be very multi-use. They have to be habitat. They also potentially have to be flood retention areas. Um, Eileen McLaughlin mentioned the Charleston Basin flood retention area in North Bayshore, which is an extremely uh, important part of the flood control. Uh, and the water, it can then be pumped into Stevens Creek. And in this case, I suppose water could be pumped into the east and the west channels. So those are areas, um, I think uh, Council Member Larson really raised an important point. This is something that a number of people have articulated concerns about, that these two channels are considered our riparian corridors as part of this ecology district. And any particular ways to incentivize opening them up and having setbacks along these corridors, encouraging planting native trees, encouraging habitat along these corridors is really key to the Ma uh, Moffat Park, as well as um, a lot of the possibilities of storing 
and saving uh, floodwaters in the open spaces that really we need to somehow articulate in our land use plan. Thank you so much for the opportunity to comment. Thanks, Kita. Mr. M Mr. Mayor, that is um, all the members of the public at this time. Okay. I will close the public hearing and bring it back to the board and council for discussion. Are there any questions uh, or comments? Uh, first up is Councilman Robert Larson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to underscore the massive scale of Moffat Park, because um, that was not apparent to me initially, just looking at maps, but after walking around out there, I, I got a sense of how big it was. And it was pointed out to me that if you compare the area of Moffat Park to downtowns of major cities, Moffat Park is actually 50% bigger than uh, downtown Portland, Oregon. It's also 50% larger than San Francisco's financial district plus south of market combined. Um, so this is a really massive opportunity. Um, it's you know very important to the city of Sunnyvale. We're putting a lot of resources into uh, developing a very comprehensive long-term plan. And clearly uh, resources are extremely important um, to this area, water especially, making sure that we have enough uh, water supply to, to support um what we're looking at but again i just wanted to underscore just how massive uh this this plan in this area is thank you thank you and and i appreciate you know those comments council, council member larson it is a very large piece of sunnyvale but it it has a lot of opportunity you know ultimately what the moffa park specific plan is is conceivably doing is designing a new city in the north half of our city. And I think that, you know, with with all the kind of looking at it from a larger view uh, of community design and not just a quick piecemeal, I, I appreciate, you know, all the residents that have been part of this, as well as, you know, all the different landowners. A lot of times uh, you have, let's say, barriers of entry for people that want to come to the table and look at the bigger picture of of what can be done. And I appreciate the different landowners, developers that have uh, really taken taken a step back and, and looked at conceivably what could be done for them um, uh, from an environmental standpoint, from an open space standpoint, as well as housing, retail, office space, and not just looking at it as a business park. So um, kudos to staff on their outreach meetings and getting the right people to, to take part. Are there any other comments or questions on this from the board or from council? I see none. So I will again pass it back to the chair for the next agenda item. Thank you, Mayor Klein. Uh, I'd like to turn the things back over to our CEO uh, calendar uh, for the next agenda item 2.6, the update on the San Francisco shoreline project. All right working to get my way off from commute there. Uh, good evening. Uh, again, we are going to go back to talking about flood protection for the last item on the agenda tonight. Um, and this project is part of the South Bay Salt Ponds Restoration Project, which aims to restore 16,500 acres of tidal wetlands. And this project directly involves all of the South Bay cities that meet the San Francisco Bay. The project's important because climate change is real. And it's projects like these that will ultimately protect shoreline cities from sea level rise. And even though this project is the beneficiary of the Safe Clean Water Program, it's also the beneficiary of the nine Bay Area County Measure AA funds. And even then, we cannot do this alone as a region, as federal support from the Army Corps of Engineers is still much needed. And locally, we'll also need the support from the city of Sunnyvale for this project to ultimately be successful. I'm going to turn this back over to Deputy, Deputy Operating Officer Rochelle Blank uh, to take us through this item. Uh, thank you, uh, CEO Calendar. Again, Rochelle Blank, and I'm going to go ahead and um, share my screen. And I'll be, uh, I have three short slides, but um, I do have a lot to share. So, as uh, CEO Calendar mentioned, this is being done in coordination with the Army Corps and the California State Coastal Conservancy. 
uh, the Coastal Conservancy had bought up the majority of these former cargo salt ponds between Coyote Creek and um, the Palo Alto Flood Basin, with the exception of two ponds, one that is owned by the City of San Jose, Pond 18, uh, the two, uh, Pond A4, which is uh, owned by Valley Water, and then these two ponds aren't part of the former salt ponds. These are part of the City of Sunnyvale's uh, treatment ponds. Um, basically, in Santa Clara County, the project is running from San Francisco Creek uh, in the west all the way to Coyote Creek in the east, and then we have uh, 101 that borders in roughly also the sea level rise um, tidal influence area. So uh, the shoreline project is a federal congressional authorized project by the U.S. Army Corps Engin Engineers together partnered with Valley Water, Coastal Conservancy, as well as the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, since they um, are in ownership of these salt ponds. Uh, the intent of the project is to identify and recommend flood risk management and ecosystem restoration um, along the South San Francisco Bay shoreline for potential federal funding. Uh, in Santa Clara County, the shoreline runs approximately 18 miles in total. So the project is recognized as of important significance uh, to preserve the economic development of the low-lying community of the potential of, of this region. Um, Santa Clara County shoreline is at risk to coastal flooding now and due to extreme storm events with climate change as well as in the future due to rising seas. Uh, the county is among those in California risk for the highest potential damages from coastal flooding. Uh, for the project, the Army Corps is the federal sponsor and Valley Water and the Coastal Conservancy are known as the local sponsors. So this slide shows again um, from San Francisco Creek all the way to Coyote Creek and as well as uh, what the Army Corps has done. We, we began studying this area with the Army Corps in 2005. And they began looking at the entire um, expanse from San Francisco Creek to Coyote Creek. And while doing so, they determined what they called economic impact areas, which began with EIA-1 and increased all the way up to EIA-11. EIA-1 is in the city of Palo Alto. EIA-11 is in North San Jose area. And um, basically, what they found is it took five years. They were studying and collecting a lot of existing data to establish what they call their baseline condition in order to then move into the alternatives. And it was just taking a long time, increasing study timeline, increasing the study costs. And in, in 2010, we kind of paused the study and said, at that point, they had enough information to kind of know some damage assessments in the various areas. Uh, for Palo Alto, for Mountain View, Sunnyvale, and North San Jose. And, and we, Valley Water and Coastal Conservancy, recommended the court break this off in pieces. And so they did move forward in 2011 with the first study phase over here in EIA 11 in North San Jose. And the intent was to include the area bound essentially from um, the Alviso Marina to Coyote Creek, just east of the city of San Jose, Santa Clara's regional wastewater facility, as well as the pocket of ponds numbered as, as A9 through A14 and potentially A18. Um, sorry, advance my own slides. <laughs> so as I mentioned, the study was just taking too long. We broke off the first chunk, began with phase one, and it's approximately four miles of the 18. And we successfully got to a chief's report by 2015. And at that point, um, it was authorized for design and construction with a project cost of 194 million. Following that, shortly afterwards, uh, the Corps had an opportunity to receive the full federal cost share of funding all at once. And of the 194 million, their federal cost share was 124 million. And they received it from the Bipartisan Budget Act. And that was intended for the core share to, to cover all the design and construction costs. So phase one of the shoreline uh, project has since realized significant cost growth. We've been trying to get this piece of um, the first two miles of levy approximately out to construction since 2018. And we have just successfully awarded a contract this year. Um, however, in doing so, we 
it became very apparent that this project's cost growth has increased significantly. It has increased from 194 million to 518 million. It's a 267% cost increase. And this cost increase is now posing a significant challenge to be able to fully implement even this phase of the study in partnership with the poor. Their federal share is fixed and we had planned for an approximate $200 million project and our, our local share is fixed as well. Um, in 2019, the Corps did receive some federal funding to go ahead and begin advancing the next feasibility study phase. And that occurred and was intended to cover EIAs one all the way through 10. And within the first three months or first quarter of their, what they call smart planning study, it was realized again that this was still too much of a piece to take off all at once. And they isolated phase two to, to specifically EIAs one through four between San Francisco Creek and Permanent Day Creek. And the majority of the area covered is the city of Palo Alto. And with the Palo Alto flood basin, um, and in conjunction with the Coastal Conservancy, their South Bay Salt Pond Restoration Project was far, far enough along to look like they could cover the remaining piece of Mountain View. So this project has um, progressed. The smart planning, core smart planning process is three years to conduct a feasibility study in three years with $3 million. And um, within the first year and a half of this effort, the Corps said, because of California's strict, stringent environmental um, laws and requirements, we're gonna, they're gonna have to recommend increasing the study by an additional three years and by an additional $3 million. And they had to go through an exemption waiver package that was sent up to headquarters in DC uh, for approval. Um, that waiver package was just very recently approved. So now we're looking at phase two being almost a six year study and at a cost of almost $6 million, cost shared 50 50. Um, lastly, we're waiting for funding to still come in on phase three. So the core at this point doesn't have any funding for phase three. Uh, we're patiently waiting. There's still an opportunity that something may come in for 2022. But with the way the cost growth has increased, um, for, for these projects, not only for the construction cost of the nearly 267%, but feasibility study cost of double up to 6 million. You know, we do have concerns of how we're gonna be able to advance these and implement fully these projects, three phases of projects on our own. Um, for the last two years, we've been working closely with SFEI and ESA, looking at a vision process for the area in Sunnyvale and uh, we are working closely with not only the city of Sunnyvale, but um, NASA, Google, Lockheed, um, Fish and Wildlife Service, Coastal Conservancy, and the goal is, was to develop a vision document um, to be able to be ready to kick off this third study phase with the Army Corps when they received money for that phase to begin. But as I noted, you know, with the project's a significant cost growth, we're not sure how we can make these projects these three phases of projects forward any longer on our own. Um, we can't shoulder the, this type of cost for a regional project alone, and we need to work with our local partners and the cities uh, in full partnership, not only in, in planning, design, and construction, but also with considering financial contributions from the local partners to fully implement these projects. And with that, I'd like to go ahead and take questions and open this up for discussion. Thank you, Rochelle. We'll see what we have. Oh, there's, there's the first public a lot to say too. first public comment. Uh, thank you for sharing. Next, uh, we have. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have no public uh, okay. raising their hand at this time. I do have a uh, vice mayor and the mayor. Okay, great. We'll 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 go with the vice mayor. Yeah, hello, Rochelle. Yeah, so first of all, thank you for being able to, you know, concisely discuss the complexity of a multi, multi, multi governmental sure type is. project that's going on. Um, I, I can't even imagine how you keep this all straight. I think my comments, I agree with the dogs. Um, yeah. on this particular one. And I, I'm, you know, as you can imagine, I'm just really disappointed that the Sunnyvale portion of this is ending up as phase three and that, you know, we're behind the funding eight ball 
and I'm disappointed with the terms and, and these are not, I'm not directing at you, um, Rochelle, you know, we're not sure what's going to happen and we're patiently waiting. And I would just offer, and maybe the mayor is going to be able to confirm this, but from the city of Sunnyvale's perspective, this is really a key important um, thing for us to go ahead and do and, and get started because it, it can't get done until it gets started. And I would just like to, to offer and request that we somehow find a way and we stop patiently waiting. I, I realize the, the multi-government agency issue, you know, but what we can do to try and do advocacy at, you know, the state or the uh, Senate and congressional level to try and push on money on this. But for the city of Sunnyvale to be in a, we don't even know what's gonna happen um, is just a horrible place for us to be. And I'm not pointing a finger at anybody here as to why that's happening. I just wanna offer that I think it's really important for us to collectively find a way to get us out of the patiently waiting model. And we need to be aggressively reminding um, our representatives in the federal government and at the state government just how critically important this is to be able to get it started. I, I don't even want to talk about the end date of, of it yet. I just want to, we need to get that it started. And, and those are my comments, but thank you very much. I, I really appreciate the, the work and the complexity of what you're talking about. Thank you, Vice thank Mayor. You. Uh, Mayor, Mayor Klein. Sure, and, and I'll second what the Vice Mayor said. That was part of what I was going to say. Uh, to me, it's critical to start the study. And I understand, you know, from a cost, from an implementation cost, it's now far outstripped what you originally thought was the going to be the cost of this project. That being said, until we kick off the study, until we finalize the study, uh, we don't know what solutions will be, you know, will be implemented from a Sunnyvale standpoint. And, and what's also critical here is the, the Moffett Park or the Moffett Airfield. You know, it's an active Air Force base. There's, it's, it's not just Sunnyvale's problem. And I, I was a little disappointed when, you know, we became part of phase three because ultimately from an Army Corps of Engineers standpoint, you know, making sure that Moffett Field is fully operational and, and dealing with any issues with sea level rise to me is in the federal government's <coughs> best interest. And, and I understand, you know, from, from your staff standpoint, it's, it's been a difficult road with, with so many jurisdictions and working with the federal government. I've, I've talked with um, Congressman Khanna multiple times on this. There was some, there were some letters written earlier uh, in the year doing advocacy as far as that's concerned. Uh, I don't think that anything made it into the infrastructure bill, but that's still in limbo, of course. Uh, but that being said, I, I do, you know, want to figure out how we move this forward, how we at least start this. Uh, ultimately, from from a study standpoint, and you know, I I understand we you are focused on how we complete phase one and you know get that in the ground because construction costs still continue to rise. That being said, you have phase two, phase three, that also construction costs are, are continuing to rise and, and until things are studied, uh, we don't know what mitigations we conceivably, and we talked about Moffett Park, could uh, make it as from a, from a cost standpoint, um, additional development that goes in Moffett Park, how that would conceivably fund the the, the requirements for uh, this shoreline sea level rise mitigation. And so, you know, those, those items are tied together. So the sooner that it gets studied on what, we, what can be implemented and what, what, what's the consensus on what needs to be implemented uh, to make sure that our residents are safe, that our businesses are safe, uh, it's, it's only, it only makes it that much more difficult to say, okay, Here's, here's the ultimate cost and here's what we conceivably might ask our businesses to add into. So I'll just throw that out there. Thank you for that work. And if there's additional advocacy and uh, that needs to be done, you know, whether or not it's local advocacy, advocacy in DC, please make that clear to our Sunnyvale staff, to me, to our council members. So, but thank you for the hard work and thank you for the update. Thanks. Great, thank you. 
Thank you, Mary. I, I, I did want to express, you know, the same concern. You know, uh, in the past, we have been pretty successful uh, with getting some of our private partners um, involved in advocating for these projects, uh, especially this one. You know, we we did have a number of executives that joined us in, in uh, Washington, D.C. a number of years ago to support a couple of our projects, including this one. Uh, we, we were pretty much, you know, pretty successful. So I think, uh, you know, we, we need to continue to do that. Uh, and we need to um, ask our private partners to be involved. This area, as we all know, not preaching to the choir here, uh, you know, have the largest uh, companies on the planet that are right there on shoreline who have obviously a global commitment to this community, uh, but also have the same challenges uh, and are facing some of the same issues that we are. So I think uh, we need to involve them a little bit more than we have in the past. Uh, and I think that they will be very helpful with us in advocating uh, when we uh, work with, um, with our DC uh, advocates. So I think uh, we need to consider that and, and we certainly will work with, uh, with the city, uh, with, with our council partners uh, and the mayor and uh, see what we can do to move this uh, project further along. And, and if it takes, you know, basically another going to DC, I'd be happy to, to be part of that advocacy trip because I do think at the end of the day, you know, it is figuring out from a federal standpoint and not that things can't be done at a state, county or city level uh, as far as this is concerned, but this is a, a bigger issue. You know, California drives the economy and, and some of those companies in, you know, Sunnyvale is the the meeting place for companies large and small uh, to a large degree and it's only in everyone's best interest that that this area as well as the airfield itself is protected so thank you great um uh now mr. i'd uh, mr chair excuse yes. me uh, a oh, council yes. council member melton had his hand raised. oh yes council member melton yeah um thank you i i also just wanted to rise um, and express just how important I feel this topic is. I, I think I feel the same sense of urgency that the Valley Water Board does on this matter and that my two colleagues have already spoken, Vice Mayor Hendricks and Mayor Klein. Uh, I feel I have everybody the same level of a, a sense of urgency, but there's just no way I could meet the eloquence uh, already spoken by Mayor Klein and um, you chair and, and Vice Mayor Hendricks on on all of this. Um, and, you know, at the kickoff of this particular agenda item, CEO calendar um, said, you know, it's going to be an all hands on deck thing where even our local partners, for example, the city of Sunnyvale have to, um, you know, help move all of this forward to the solution. And um, it, was, it was easy to predict that um, there's a financial component, but I think Mayor Klein and, and you, Chair Esther, Chair, um, you know, also hit on federal level advocacy. And, you know, I, I would be of the opinion, uh, I know Mayor Klein would do a great job in advocacy in Washington because I've seen him do it with my own eyes when we've been out there together. But this is sort of all hands on deck and the more board members, and the more council members, uh, that can be advocating and pushing on multiple fronts. This topic is that important. And so Chair, I know you'll lead um, Valley Water in this and uh, Mayor Klein, I know you'll lead Sunnyvale. It's, it's not just on your shoulders, Larry. This topic is important enough that, um, you know, when the time comes to spread the load and, and push on multiple fronts, um, it's that important. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. We have Council Member Larson and CEO Calendar that both have their hands raised. Oh, yes. Uh, Councilman Larson? Um, I, if uh, CEO Calendar would like to respond to Council Member Melton, I think okay. it's appropriate. To... All right. Uh, Rick? Yeah, thank you for the chair. And, and I want to thank Council Member Melton for his comments, as well as Mayor Klein. And, and I don't want to leave the council thinking that um, I was talking about the partnership was a financial partnership. I think what we're what I'm talking about is exactly 
what Mayor Klein described. We need your help in lobbying. We need your help in supporting this project. And we need your help in moving this forward. We'll continue to fight. We'll continue to seek the funds for the funds, I believe, are out there. But we can't get to the funds by ourselves. You know, we, we, we can we'll go in and we'll uh, try to do some of the heavy lifting. But I think your voices, your local voices, is uh, as our chair had talked about, uh, some of these corporate voices that would be involved are really what's needed. So we really do need your policy level support in making this go. Councilmember uh, Larson. Yeah, Councilman, Lar Councilman Larson. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. <laughs> and, and thank you, CEO Callender, um, for, for uh, clarifying uh, the, the support that would be most helpful uh, to Valley Water. And I, I just wanted to touch a, briefly on the uh, cost escalations on phase one, um, just to understand a, a little bit yeah. better what the drivers were. And really what I'm getting to is um, like, what takeaways from that do we have so that we can have um, better refine our estimates for phase two and phase three, because I think it's gonna be um, important to, as we do advocate to, to have a, a clear number in mind. And I realize there can be many different reasons for escalations, but to the extent that we've, yeah. we've refined our process, that would be um, great to hear about. Uh, sure, through the chair, I can answer yes, this yes, question. Sure. But it is the cost of the engineered levy field material. Um, originally, during the feasibility study at phase one, it was the, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service was able to uh, procure material at a very low cost to nearly free, and that was used as the basis that that material would continue. However, uh, as we've moved forward with phase one and th through the permitting process, um, the, the Corps of Engineers has a very strict engineering requirement for that fill as well as the regional board has some strict quality um, placement requirements when that fill meets the water. So as it turns out, this fill is almost having to be made to meet those specifications. And it is coming out to, to close to a 50 to $70 a cubic yard price tag for, for the fill material. So, um, our staff has been busy touring um, in San Mateo County, Foster City area, uh, how they've implemented their projects to, to see what their price tags are and what they're doing, because building levees may not be the way, to, the way to go. In Foster City, they're doing a combination of levees and sheet pile walls, um, and, and it may take you know different kind of thinking in the future for the remaining shoreline lengths, um, that it's not all filled. It's not all filled to bring up these levees from an average of eight to 10 feet to the needed 15 foot height. It may be um, some fill in combination with sheet pile walls, you know? So, but the, the biggest driver really is procuring the engineering fill. As well as um, this project in phase one proposed what we called an ecotone, a horizontal type living levee that allows for um, not only wetland features, but special status species to be able to migrate up and down with the ebb and flow of the tide and to adapt to sea level rise. That fill also is has become very expensive. So doing a 30 to one slope, which is about 300 feet out into some of these ponds is you know not really realistic any longer. Um, so it's, it's re-engineering or redesigning how those ecotones need to be built to lower that amount of fill required to enter these ponds, you know, to help buffer um, and protect the levees once they're built, as, as well as, you know, maybe the levees just can't be as high because you have to incorporate a short flood wall or, or, or a sheet pile wall into them as well. Hey, thank you, I, I appreciate the detailed answer and sort of the, the window into the complexities that, yes. that you have to uh, deal with on the project. Thank you. Anybody else? Nobody else. Um, okay, so um, let's see. Uh, uh, thank you all for the discussion. Uh, there's no motion 
uh, required on this informational item. And so uh, I'll ask Mayor Klein for any closing remarks that you might have. Okay. Thank you. Ch thank you, Chair Estramera. Uh, I just want to thank the Valley Water Board of Directors and their staff for this meeting. I also want to thank, you know, our city manager and Sunnyvale city staff, as well as my colleagues for, for you know, the hard work in, you know, in what we've done today as far from a discussion standpoint, as far as updating everyone else. And, you know, as we, as we all know, you know, having clean, safe, reliable water is critical for the Bay Area and for all of California, but, but especially for um, our, our Santa Clara Valley. You know, it's critical that our two organizations are in sync and the working partnership is critical to make us both more successful. You know, making sure that we're on the same page, making sure that what we need to do from an advocacy standpoint, from an implement implementation standpoint, helps break down any of those barriers that we that we come across in making uh, in moving towards that that final conclusion of what we want uh, for Moffat Moffat Park as far as sea level rise, as far as you know, dealing with all the issues and getting clean water and enough clean water that we that we that ever, that it's not an issue in the Bay Area and especially the in, in the valley here. But hopefully meetings like this will help continue to improve those partnerships and collaboration. Uh, we will not take another several years for our next meeting. And I That's look right. forward to when we can meet again. So thank you again for this joint meeting and, and have a good evening. Thank you, Mayor Klein. Uh, wanted, of course, to thank uh, the mayor and uh, city council members uh, for, our, and also, of course, your staff and, and ours for this uh, uh, great meeting and our great discussions uh, this evening. You know, I, I'm always so proud when we show our constituents uh, what true government is, you know, when local government uh, is engaged like we are with partners. Uh, we work together on our projects. We share our constituents and therefore share, you know, the hopes and dreams. Uh, and we work on these projects together and we solve their problems. I'm always so proud when we have these kinds of meetings uh, where we also show our constituents uh, what the difference is in, in government and how important it is for them to also be uh, involved, to support us, uh, and to work closely with us. So uh, thank all of you. And um, we, um, let's see, uh, uh, I'll have uh, the mayor adjourn, uh, adjourn their meeting, and then I will after. Okay, uh, this meeting is adjourned. I want to thank everyone for participating in a joint meeting. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, I apologize. There is a member of the public that has raised their hand. I don't, would you like to? Sure. Okay. I'm, sure. We, yes, have, we haven't yet. Sure. sure. Ms. Aguita Dev. Yes. Ms. Dev. Thank you so much. I did not mean to be at the very last speaker. I apologize. Not a problem. I didn't raise my heart <laughs> at the hand in time. Um, I thank you very much for the information. Um, Rochelle's uh, explanation was very poignant. And um, I do want to point out that there have been some stuff. I do want to point out that we cannot ignore the ecology and health of the Bay itself um, as we look at solutions. Uh, I know that Rochelle pointed out that some of the longer levees will be expensive and that is certainly the case however what we don't want to end up with is basically with everyone putting sheet pile levees up sheet pile walls up so that what we end up with is basically a bathtub and not a bay with living shorelines critical to the ecological health of the bay is the living shorelines we lost 90% of it. We're trying to get up to a certain amount. We're nowhere near there yet. So part of our solutions as we confront sea level rise has to be keeping the bay alive and healthy for, otherwise it's a dead body of water. A bathtub is not a bay. So this is a really difficult problem and 
I appreciate uh, the conversation around it. I don't want you to think that when Foster City raises its levies using sheet piles, that that's a good thing. The studies that Stanford has done, other universities have done, and Spur had a, had a webinar on it just yesterday, that when one city raises walls to prevent water coming into their area, it affects other cities around the Bay. If San Jose were to do that, if we were to do that in the South Bay, it would affect Napa. So this is a regional problem. The living shorelines are a crucial part of the solution. Crucial part of the solution. Putting up a wall, building concrete walls or sheet pile walls is not going to help us. We may do that you know, for one mile and affect 10 miles in other areas where the water will go. So it's really important to come up with nature-based adaptations rather than walls. And the Army Corps is coming to that point of view. In Moffett Park, we've pointed out that using the wetlands as flood retention allows us to tap into different sources of revenue. There are different sources of revenue and credits that FEMA gives, that the federal government gives, that the Army Corps will now give for nature-based solutions, which benefit both nature and people. I wanted to bring that to our attention as we close the session. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Dev. Uh, uh, thank you for all your comments this evening. You've been very helpful. Appreciate your participation. All right, so we'll adjourn uh, to uh, 1 p.m. on a uh, closed session on October 12th, followed by a public session uh, thereafter. Thank you again, and good evening to everyone. Please be safe. Have a good evening. Thank you. Good evening.